Good morning, everyone that's out there listening. Thank you for joining us again for our webinar series. Today, we're going to talk about um, something not that different, but a little different than what we've talked about recently. We've been talking about things like oxidative stress and different things that relate to longevity and inflammation. Um, but today, we're going to go back to the basics of orthopedics and talk about knee pain. And the reason I want to talk about knee pain, and we really could do it for any body part that you guys wanted to hear about, is to show you and discuss all of the many, 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 many different reasons the knee might hurt. So it's not always just that you're bone on bone, like your doctor probably told you, and that you need a total knee. Um, I hear that all the time. People come see me mostly because they don't want surgery and they want natural ways to heal or different alternatives, um, at least until, you know, it's clear that they have to have some sort of surgery. Um, but usually when they come at their first visit, they always tell me their other doctor told them they were bone on bone. And 99 times out of 100, that's really not the case. It's kind of just something easy to say to people, I think. I don't think it's malicious. I think it's just sort of, you know, when you're seeing so many people a day in clinic and you have to have throughput for the hospital administrators, you have a script. Anyway, so we're going to talk about knee pain. What? All right, we're going to talk about knee pain today in great detail. So if you're out there with knee pain, this is a talk for you because you're going to hear probably 17 different reasons that your particular knee pain might be occurring, um, which tells you how complicated this issue really is and, you know, why different treatment parameters are, ta are thought of for different people, um, because it's really, it's really hard to really narrow down and figure out exactly why a knee might hurt. So I'm Dr. Meredith Warner, Warner Orthopedics and Wellness, and this is my monthly webinar series that I do just to do it, and uh, we're going to talk about knee pain. I'm excited. All right. This is my clinic, sort of what we do. We do everything that you can possibly think of that is um, promoting of empowerment of health. So I want the body to do what the body does best, which is heal. So we human beings are never going to be as good as what the body does. I mean, they're just molecular reactions and enzymatic processes going on billions of times a second, trying to fix you and make you better. And all we have to do really is just get out of the way, let it happen in an appropriate fashion. And that's my goal. I do things that make the body heal better. And then as a last resort, we'll do surgery. Obviously, I'm a surgeon um, and I love surgery, but a lot of times I don't think it's necessary for particular problems, one of which is knee pain, but I do operate on knees. So there you go. This is my clinic and it's all set up and designed to promote physical wellness and physical health as well as um, the mental aspects of healthcare and wellness. And uh, we have an amazing physical therapy team, which I think if you have really, really good physical therapists and a physician that understands the physical body um, the, and the anatomy and all of the variety of reasons that a knee might hurt, together you can actually come up with protocols and algorithms that will actually get people better without surgery. And we do that all day long, all day for all body parts, um, but particularly knee pain. Now, my primary subspecialty is foot and ankle surgery, but I do operate on knees. I really do everything, sort of a generalist. Um, but knee pain is one of the more common pains in the United States. That's why I wanted to talk to you about it today. Okay, so this is sort of the general reasons that you have probably heard that you have knee pain and, and the doctors have told you. So generally, it's thought to be degenerative or wear and tear or from an injury. Okay, generally, that's not true. A uh, sprain is something that you're told you have often, and that's when you have damage to a ligament or the tendon unit of a muscle where a muscle attaches to a bone. T ligaments attach bone to bone. Tendons attach muscle to bone. So tendons are important for movement. Ligaments are important for restraint of a joint, like keeping things from flipping off and twisting away or becoming very unstable. Either one can get sprained or strained. Now, strain, I put this picture on the bottom right of this slide. It's technically, strain is a is a deformation or a change in the shape of a structure when a certain force is applied. If your ligaments or tendons have too much strain, they will sprain. And a sprain is usually a graded one through three. So one is just a couple fibers, two is kind of a partial tear, three is a fully, fully torn. You gotta do something about that. Torn cartilage, people are told all the time, oh, you tore your cartilage in that car wreck. Well, what does that even mean? Because everybody has cartilage damage when you really look at it. Um, but basically, torn cartilage will often occur. If you have an impact injury that is strong enough to tear, let's say your ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament of your knee, you might be a football fan and you hear about this every season, somebody tears their ACL, right? If you have an injury strong enough to 
do that to your knee and rip the ACL, one of the connections between the femur bone and the thigh bone, you're probably going to get cartilage damage. And in fact, we have a sign we look for on MRI that bone bruising in certain parts of the bones that is indicative of that slam injury and that cartilage damage that occurs with the ligament strain. And then, of course, arthritis. And we'll talk about that in detail. Stress fractures can happen. Stress fractures in the knee are relatively not as common as in like the distal tibia or the hip fracture of foot. Foot is the most common location probably for stress fractures. But if you have poor bone quality or you overload normal bone quality to a significant degree, of course, you could get a stress fracture. Now, what is pretty common nowadays is bone edema and micro stress fracturing under the subchondral surface of the bone. What do I mean by subchondral? Well, I guess you could look at this clipboard. If you think of this white paper as the cartilage, the clipboard is the subchondral bone. So it's this very thin, hard bone plate on which sits cartilage. And then underneath is the spongy bone, and then it goes to the rest of the bone. So you can get subchondral stress fractures just from inflammatory conditions, oxidative stress, low levels of vitamin D, poor bone metabolism thyroid disease, a million reasons to have that. But that is a true source of pain. And nowadays, a lot of people are doing what's called a subchondroplasty, where you actually inject sort of liquid forms of bone graft into that area and let it solidify and support it and treat the fracture that way. So it's pretty cool. So sometimes surgery is needed, but a lot of times you can get away with natural remedies. Okay, I put this these images, if you can, I can hope you can see them. I, I put the clinical picture there in sort of a cross section of what we're looking at. Think of these pictures as slices of a bread loaf, and you're just looking at that one slice, okay? So it just, and the top part of each picture is the front of the knee, and that sort of um, oblong structure there is the patellar tendon. And then under it, you see these semicircular um, objects. Those are the menisci, okay? The meniscus is single menisci, both, so you have one on each side of the knee. And then the ACL and the PCL are coming up in the middle of the knee. They sit between the menisci, okay? The cruciate ligaments, so the menisci is here. The cruciate ligaments are here. And they all achieve rotational and, and control in both the sagittal and coronal plane of the knee. Basically, so when you're running, your whole body doesn't fly off of your shin bone. This is how it keeps it all together. So the differential diagnosis in medicine, we always have a differential. So somebody comes with a let's say a runny nose, your differential is sinusitis, head cold, COVID, blah, blah, blah. Like you go down a list of things that could be, and then you use other signs and symptoms to eliminate things off that differential diagnosis, and then you get your diagnosis. So if somebody comes to me for knee pain, this is what I'm always, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking of this amongst other things. It could be their nerve, they could have a tendon contracture, they could have a ligament contracture, they could have muscle weakness, they could have muscle tightness, they could have myofascial pain, they could just have a pure dysfunction biomechanically where the hip's not linking to the knee, not linking to the ankle, um, or they could have some type of arthritis. So all of this has to be thought about and ruled out whenever somebody comes to see us with knee pain. Okay, nerve pain. This is one of the primary reasons knees hurt. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. A lot of people forget about the nerves. The only reason that you ever feel pain is because your brain tells you that you do. How does the brain tell you that you do? Because it receives a signal from the knee that travels through the spinal cord into your brain and it gets manipulated and modulated. And then certain neural circuits in your brain fire off and interpret that electrical signal as a painful stimuli. So you can see there's a lot of ways that nerve pain could be really the true source of pain. And if you look at these images, not the one on the left yet, look on the one on the right, look at how complicated the innervation of the knee is. There are so many nerves that go to the knee and uh, go to the capsular tissue and the bone and the ligaments, uh, but guess what doesn't have nervous input? Cartilage. So cartilage uh, in and of itself has no ability to send a signal to the brain. What does have the ability to send a signal of pain and why people feel pain with arthritis is because it's a whole joint disease, like the capsule will hurt or the meniscus will hurt or one of the ligaments will hurt or the bone will hurt, but usually cartilage doesn't hurt. The picture on the left sort of shows you in even more sort of, I guess, better detail, the innervation of the actual capsule and bones right around the front of the knee. So SMGN is superior medial genicular nerve. And then you have the inferior medial genicular nerve. And then on the outside by the fibula, the far left of the screen, you have the superior lateral genicular nerve. Those are all the stars. 
These are points where we do what are called peripheral nerve stimulators or nerve blocks. And we can actually block this signal from the knee to the brain. So whatever is causing the knee pain, it doesn't matter if you can block the signal from the nerve because your brain will never be able to interpret that pain signal. So it's pretty complicated, but it's pretty cool. And this is a great treatment method that we have that I do a lot now uh, to reduce knee pain. And I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more. So dermatomes, you may have heard this term, you may not have. This is basically um, each nerve that comes out of the spinal cord is responsible for a certain area of the body in terms of giving the sensory input of that particular area to your brain, okay? So your C1 nerve root does something, your C8 nerve root does something, your L1, your L2, your L3, your L4, your L5. This shows you what's going on in the knee. And if you look on the bottom little picture, the left side is looking at the knee from the front, like you're looking at someone. And then if that person turned around and you were looking at the back of their knee, that's the right side. So anterior is front, posterior is back. And it shows you, so let's say we're talking about the medial or the inside part of the knee, the anterior, it's purple. So that's saphenous nerve. It's That's the dermatome and the osteotome are responsible for bone pain there. And then if you flip it around on the back, the back part of the inside of the knee is the tibial nerve. So this is what you sort of have to think about every time somebody comes in. So if somebody comes in with lateral knee pain, not only am I thinking of lateral meniscus, lateral cartilage, um, lateral collateral ligament, et cetera. But I'm also thinking, well, it could be something from the common perineal nerve, or it could be the superior lateral geniculate nerve. So you kind of have to rule all of this out. And it um, becomes very important because you can treat nerve pain pretty easily, much safer and much more easily than you can do other surgeries. So this bottom little picture illustration with that little device sitting on top of a section of skin there, that shows you the peripheral nerve stimulator. It's literally just a tiny metal lead that you place next to the nerve that you think is causing pain. And then there's a wireless receiver that you stick on your skin when you need it. Don't have to wear it all the time, just when it bothers you or you can pre-treat in the morning and then post-treat at night. Anyway, it sends a signal to this little lead that sends a, a little tiny current and it overwhelms the um, signal. So the painful signal that would be coming from the knee to your brain is essentially blocked by this stimulator. It's pretty awesome and uh, the results have been quite amazing. Uh, the trick is to pick where, which name nerve do you put it on? And as you can see on our illustration on the left, which this medical illustrator did a great job, you could block any one of these. So what I usually do is I'll do an initial diagnostic injection with like lidocaine to numb up the nerve. And if a patient says, yeah, that feels better, then we'll do a lead trial with like um, a little lead we can put in clinic and test it with stimulations. And then if they like that and they feel like it really helps their pain, then we put in one permanently. Um, if it's covered, of course, because of course, all treatment decisions are ultimately made by insurance companies. Um, but this is a pretty slick little uh, device. And you can see, so the dots, the brown dots on the screen here show you common places or common nerves that are blocked that successfully treat chronic knee pain. And of course that's important because you don't wanna be on narcotics or any kind of pain meds for a very long time, as you all know. So knee pain can be from anything. The capsule, which is sort of, I think a capsule is a water balloon that surrounds the joint. So this capsule would go from the femur to the patella, to the tibia and fibula, and just holds everything in. Synovial fluid in, is in this water balloon, not water. Um, and these are all the different types of nerve endings. And each one has a different pattern of firing and goes to a different neural circuit. But together, they give a picture in your brain of what's going on with your knee. So different nerve endings tell your knee or tell your brain where your knee is, how your knee's moving. Is it moving fast? Is it moving slow? Where are you in space? And then other ones will send pen, pain signals. You have to think of all of these. You might just have a stretch of one of these nerves and it just might need time to relax and calm down. And then the pain gets better. That's probably why a lot of you out there have tweaked your knee and you don't go see a doctor and somehow it gets better. Probably it just stretched the capsule and irritated some nerves and then it got better. And that's how it works. It's a beauty of the human body. So let's talk about the medial knees. So the medial in, in medicine is inside and lateral is outside. Okay. So medial is going to be the inside part of your knee. So like you can touch your two medial knees together. So here, different reasons that you might have pain are adductor contractures. You can see um, 
Well, you can't see it too well on this picture, but underneath that muscle called sartorius is the adductor muscle that's coming in. And those are the muscles that let you do those clamshell movements where you bring your knee together or where you cross your leg over the other one. And some people, that's an inner thigh muscle. Those things will get so contracted and tight and where they attach to the distal femur by the knee becomes extremely painful. So sometimes medial knee pain is not arthritis, not bone on bone, it's just an adductor contracture. So a lot of times my physical therapist will do dry needling and different deep tissue or cupping and try to release that out. Um, and or I'll do injections to take care of trigger points there. And then the knee pain gets better. And then, so think about this too. Most of the population is slightly bow-legged. Okay, we call that varus. So curved a little bit like this, which means 60% of your body's weight generally goes through the medial knee, 40% through the lateral knee. So the medial knee is always going to be a little bit more prone to pain just because it'll get tight and contracted and it'll have a little axial load and impacting and, and more rotational deformations or changes. So the medial knee is filled with areas that might hurt. So you've got your medial gastroc tendon. So that's the calf muscle comes up and attaches on the knee. Some people get what's called tennis knee or jumper's knee where the, um, not jumper's knee, tennis knee, where the tear, they'll get a tear in that muscle and or in the myotendinous junction up by the back of the knee. And that hurts, but it's just a muscle strain and generally they get better. Um, and then you've got the hamstrings coming down. You've got the patella, all the joint capsule connecting the kneecap, which is called the patella, to the rest of the knee. And then, of course, you have meniscus and arthritis and whatnot. But the medial knee is filled with different anatomic structures, as is the lateral knee, as you would imagine. Oh, somebody said thank you for the information. What? Missy. Uh, you're welcome. I enjoy doing this. Um, it takes a lot of time, but I like to teach. All right. So back to, this is still the medial knee. So I, I put this anatomic picture of the medial knee next to the cartoony picture showing the innervation. Okay. So remember the anterior knee, you're looking at it from front. The tibia is the bottom bone next to that big letter B. The purple block is corresponding to what you're looking at anatomically here, which is going to be mostly saphenous nerve. And you can see the saphenous nerve coming out of the anterior, I'm sorry, out of the medial aspect of the anterior knee on the anatomic picture, right under that sartorius muscle. That's one of the primary nerves we block with a peripheral nerve stimulator or inject. Sometimes I'll just put steroid to try to calm it down if it's inflamed. And then the back part is going to be the tibial nerve. And that's more by that medial gastroc muscle, like in the very back part of the knee. So you can kind of start to see how we think about knee pain when somebody comes to our office. Not only do you think about the anatomic structures, but you have to think about what innervates them. And then on top of that, you got to think about the blood flow to the area. Okay, so let's move on to tendon contractures. And this is just a magnified picture of what's going on when you think of tendons. This is like, a, this isn't even like massively magnified, but you can see how complicated these structures are. And then inside of that are billions of cells doing all kinds of crazy chemical reactions all the time to try to keep us moving and going. Um, so the human body is amazingly complex, but tendon contractures will cause severe pain. So a tendon is simply collagen bundles. Okay. It's protein. So think of it like braided rope. And you, you, your braided rope is supposed to be a certain amount of length. It's supposed to have a certain amount of elasticity and a certain amount of force applied to it on any given movement. Well, if you get stiff, and you can get stiff from a variety of reasons, um, the tendon will not elongate the way it's supposed to, or it loses a little bit of its elasticity, or worse, it'll actually shorten and get locked into that position. So you may know somebody that had a total knee replacement who now has a flexion contracture, meaning that they are unable to straighten their knee completely. Why? Because either their posterior capsule is contracted, or the big tendons on the back of the knee are fully contracted. And you, it takes a lot of therapy work to undo that, or sometimes you have to actually go in and redo the total knee to take care of that. Because having a permanently bent knee, even if it's only five degrees, will dramatically alter what your ankle and your hip and your lumbar and your pelvis are doing when you're walking and running. So tendon contractures are a huge source of knee pain. 
The Achilles, believe it or not, so your heel cord, if that gets contracted, that is gonna mess with your knee. Why? Because a portion of the Achilles tendon is the gastroc muscle, which crosses the knee and attaches to the back of the femur. Hamstring contractures obviously can cause knee pain. Extensor mechanism, meaning the quadriceps, which lets you, like if you think of the motion of kicking a ball, that's your quadriceps firing and pulling your tibia forward on your knee. You can get contractures there, which means you won't be able to pull your leg, you know, where you can touch the back of your heel to your butt, that stretch. You wouldn't be able to do that because the front of your knee is too tight and contracted. The IT band, which is lateral on the outside of the knee. And a lot of people, if you've got a tight contracted IT band on the knee, you'll actually get a hip bursitis because they're connected. And then, of course, the adductor muscle, which we talked about. And then curl fascia, which everybody forgets. This is the first layer of fascia that kind of, I think of it like an enormous sock. It kind of just holds everything together. So you have this big outer layer of fascia, and then you've got more layers going inside. Meanwhile, all of the fascia is connected crossways too and diagonally. So you can treat like an IT band by doing something up at the hip and or at the lumbar sacral fascia on the other side or at the perineal tendon fascia deep at the ankle because they're all connected. So you can treat one body part by releasing another one. This is sort of the technique massage therapist. If you have a good one, they use this technique. If you have a good physical therapist, they understand this. All right, ligament contractures. So um, this is, again, the medial knee, a little bit, I guess, grosser picture for you. If you see that thing that looks like a steak on the top, well, that's because it's muscle, which is meat, okay? That's the VMO, vastus medialis obliquus. It's one of the muscles that attaches to the kneecap and stabilizes it. If you know somebody that has so-called patellar instability or patellar subluxation where the kneecap shifts around, a lot of times that muscle is very, very weak in those people, and they are just unable to keep their patella from sliding laterally because they just don't have that little muscle. And then these are just the hemostat there is underneath one of the many, many medial knee structures. But the real reason I like this picture for you guys, now you can see the adductor tendon on the top right under that vastus medialis obliquus muscle. Okay, and again, that's that inner thigh muscle that will just become this horribly painful cord. It starts on the pubic symphysis, which is, you know, where the middle part of the pelvis sort of between the legs, that's where the muscle originates. Then it goes down the leg and attaches on the femur like that. So, and a lot of people are just, we're so deconditioned and we just don't use that muscle enough so it'll contract up on us. Then you've got the medial gastroc tendon sort of going vertically. Remember I told you the gastroc muscle crosses the knee. So the Achilles, you, if you have a tight Achilles, you can have knee problems. That's why, because of that tendon. And then SM is semimembranosis. That's one of your hamstrings. So whenever you get a baker cyst or a popliteal cyst, so if somebody ever told you you had a baker cyst, they usually pooch out of the knee joint right between the medial gastroc tendon and the semimembranosis. So a lot of times I can get people to lay on their stomach in clinic and get an ultrasound. I can actually drain a Baker cyst right there in clinic because it's usually pretty superficial right at that spot, right between those two tendons. Okay, Chris just told us that he is bone on bone and um, no cartilage left on imaging and he does have a flexion contracture and he's trying to cut out sugar and white flour, which is great. And we're gonna talk about why later because a lot of the pain of arthritis or bone on bone, remember cartilage doesn't have nerve cells. A lot of the pain is just inflammation and oxidative stress changes. So if you can control that, you can control a lot of your pain. Now, in some cases you're, still going to have to have surgery. I'm not here to say you're not. Total knee arthroplasty is one of the most commonly done surgeries in the United States of America, of course. Um, but cutting out sugar is probably the best thing you can do for yourself in general, and particularly for the pain associated with arthritis. So here's some more cool pictures. I mean, the human body is, if you start thinking about it, like I do, I mean, it's just amazing how everything works together and just, it's so perfect. Um, so here we're going to talk about a medial patellofemoral ligament. So remember medials on the inside, patella is the kneecap, femoral is your femur, ligament connects bone to bone. So this ligament connects the inside part of your kneecap to your femur. And what does it do? In addition to the vastus medialis obliquus, which you can see in the top right picture there, VMO, in addition to that muscle coming down to the kneecap, you have a medial patellofemoral ligament giving you a static restraint to keep the patella from going 
flip into the outside every time you flex your knee and run. Sometimes that tears, sometimes it gets uh, t uh, partially torn, sometimes it gets contracted, uh, sometimes it'll get a direct blow. A million reasons the MPFL can hurt, but this is one of the primary reasons for medial knee pain and patellar subluxation issues. Um, and then you've got more minor and secondary ligaments on the medial side of the knee, patella meniscal ligaments. So that tells you that this connects the kneecap to the meniscus. Well, what if that was contracted and you didn't really have meniscal tear pain, but then you went and got a knee scope and they removed part of your meniscus, but that was never addressed. Well, now you're missing part of your meniscus, which does what? That actually hastens the progression of arthritis. So I try to have my patients avoid partial meniscectomies if at all possible. And then, so I look for every other reason that could potentially be the source of pain, um, really in every body part. We do this all the time. It's not just me. Um, but this shows you how complicated just the medial, just the inside part of the knee is. I mean, think about it. All right, next. And more on just the medial knee. And I put this top picture to show you that sometimes you break a bone, you have a fracture, and you got to go get that fixed. It is what it is. There's pretty much consensus, <clears throat> meaning that most surgeons agree that if certain bones are broken, they need to be fixed in certain ways. Um, although that's not even 100% true. There's very few types of fractures that we all agree on. Most people would agree that a mid shaft femur fracture needs a femoral nail, things like that. But just to show you, I'm talking about my little weird pains that nobody can figure out what's going on. But if you have a break like that after a car accident, that's probably one of your sources of pain, probably should be addressed. But let's say you don't have that. It could be any of these other structures. What if you had, look at the left picture, that shows you the blood vessels. I've had patients where they have um, a block peripheral arterial disease in the big vessel in the back of the knee, the popliteal. And then so you know there's little baby blocks going to the, the feeder vessels that feed certain structures in the knee. So of course they're going to hurt because they're not getting any oxygen to that region. <clears throat> so a lot of times I'll actually, sorry, I'll send people for vascular studies, especially if they're in a risk group for peripheral arterial disease, to make sure that their knee is getting even the oxygen it's supposed to be getting to function, to not produce ox free radicals and chronic inflammation. Okay, so let's talk about, this is a pretty common source of pain for a lot of people. So a lot of people have medial inside knee pain. It's right next to the joint. So they think it's arthritis. You get an x-ray, you get told, oh, you got arthritis. Um, but everything they do in the joint, uh, rooster comb injections, steroid injections, whatever, nothing works. You still have this pain. Well, sometimes the pain is, Remember I showed you that semimembranosis in the hamstrings? Sometimes the pain is coming from down there. And look what's right over those hamstring tendons inserting on the top of the tibia, the infrapatellar saphenous nerve. Again, another source of nerve pain. And all of this is just beneath the joint line. So you might have what's called a pesbursitis, which is inflamed um, area where all the medial hamstrings insert on the knee, or you might just have a problem with that nerve and it has nothing to do with the knee joint itself or it's a hamstring contra contracture, same area, or it's a saphenous neuritis. Remember, you saw how the saphenous exits right there, or it could be arthritis, but you gotta rule out all of this. And this is showing somebody getting injected in the pes verso, which is very easy to do in clinic, very simple, and has great results if this is a true sort of source of pain. And I think, um, next. All right, so this just shows you a little bit more detail. So those are the three hamstrings on the inside of your leg coming down and inserting on the upper inside part of your tibia bone or your shin bone right beneath the knee joint. So there's the sartorius, the gracilis, and the semitendinosus all coming over the medial collateral ligament, which can also be a source of medial knee pain, and inserting on the bone. And what you don't see in this picture is there's usually a bursa over that, which is like an empty water bottle kind of a thing that just allows free glide and free movement, well, sometimes that'll get inflamed. And that's what this injection is doing. It's treating bursitis of those three tendons. A very common source of knee pain. So let's talk about another source of knee pain, muscle weakness. Now, obviously this guy has no weakness, or we, we think he doesn't. He maybe just took Lasix before he had this picture shot like a lot of bodybuilders do. But look at that knobby muscle right above his kneecap on the inside. That's your VMO. Now think about what your VMO looks like or mine we're not nearly as well developed as this guy. How do you develop it? It's the terminal 15 degrees of a leg extension. So if you're sitting on the leg extension machine with the weights, it's the last 15 degrees, okay, that really make that muscle stronger. 
and can control your patella patella glide. Um, Cause your patella is supposed to stay in a straight line with knee flexion, but in some people it kind of like, or they get a J sign it's called, like it could be all over the place. But if you have good dynamic stabilizers and good strength, then everything works better. And so the picture on the right shows you in more detail, the quadriceps, why is it called a quadriceps? Cause quad is four. So there's four muscle bellies to your quad, but they all come down and effectively just extend the knee. Okay. So that's our whole purpose in life. But some of them will attach up and cross the hip. So they also act as hip flexors. So you can see sometimes you could treat a patella femoral problem by rehabbing the hip. And maybe you have a hip flexion contracture because you're a distance runner. And then you have patella femoral pain. So you're trying to do all kinds of stuff for that. But really what you need to have done is get your hip made more flexible and then the uh, hip stabilizing muscles stronger and then your patella femoral pain gets better. Why? Because this is all linked. The IT band comes from the side of the patella, quadriceps comes from the front and up, the adductor comes from the inside and the hamstrings are in the back kind of, most of us have tight hamstrings kind of messing everything up because you've got this almost like a rubber band in the back that's not letting your knee move correctly because we never stretch our hamstrings. So muscle weakness is a huge problem, particularly in our country. And if, uh, if especially as you age, because you get what, what's called sarcopenia, sarcopenia of aging. So most of us will lose muscle just because time passes, unless you do something to prevent it, which you can, it's totally preventable and it doesn't take a ton of work to do. You just need to do some resistance work like two or three times a week for like 20 minutes. Probably your physical therapist or if you have a personal trainer can help you with that. Next. All right. <clears throat> Muscle weakness. Why else is this important? Proprioception. So this is your brain. Remember all the neural circuits that are connecting to those variety of different receptors I showed you on that other slide. Your brain has this crazy ability to know where you are in space and to know not only where you are, but if you're moving forwards, backwards to the side, twisting and how fast you're doing that. And if you're balanced or if you're about to fall, because think about it, if your brain senses that your quad buckled and you're about to fall, guess what happens? You reflexively brace and block your fall, right? Proprioception. That's what that means. Knowing your position in space. So a lot of people after surgery, like after total knee arthroplasty, after anterior cruciate ligament or ACL repair, they spend a lot of time getting back their innate sense of proprioception. Fascial rebound, energy storage. So remember I told you collagen has to have a certain amount of elastin to um, allow movement and to let the tendon or ligament stretch a bit. Well, that stretch serves two functions. Not only does it let the joint move the way it's supposed to move, but that stretch is an energy storage capacitor, if you think of it. it's like a battery. And so when it comes back, that energy is released and, and makes the muscle more efficient. Well, if you have poor ability to do that, like if your fascia is stiff, thick, non-elastic, damaged in some way, or you have some sort of connective tissue disease and your fascia doesn't work correctly, well, then everything becomes inefficient and doesn't work right because you don't have this ability to store energy and, and use it to make your walking and running better. Hydraulics. So I tell people when I send them to rehab, because I have a lot of patients that say, oh, well, what is PT going to do for my knee arthritis? They can't do anything. And I, I, you know, I try to get into it. It's, it's a big topic, but one of the reasons that it helps is if you can build up the muscle and get more like this left guy, the circle on the left with the massive muscles, none of us are going to look like that, by the way. But if you get closer to that, then you almost have like hydraulics, like, you know how the lift gate goes up in the back of your car and those things extend and come down. Those are your hydraulics. Well, you can do the same thing for your knee by making the muscles that cross the knee, which includes the quadriceps, the hamstrings, the gastroc, and there's a few smaller ones that do then basically you are providing a hydraulic cage around your knee that protects it from injury and makes it more stable. And then that gives you stiffness and protection. So muscle weakness is a huge thing. And I think if a lot of us just were stronger, probably people like me would be out of work. And then now let's talk about muscle tightness, also a problem. So you want strong muscles because you want muscular stiffness around a joint, but you don't want that associated with tendon contractures fascial contractures, and you don't want your muscle to be unable to lengthen and shorten at will. Okay. So you don't want muscle tightness. So usually this is a maladaptive thing. Like you'll get a flexion contracture after a total knee, either because of pain, or maybe the total knee was like the posterior capsule wasn't released quite enough during putting it in. Um, 
or maybe you had an old hamstring tear playing football when you were 16, you don't even remember it, but the muscles in the middle of the hamstring got knotted up and scarred, so now you got a hamstring contracture. A million reasons you could have muscle tightness, muscle stiffness, but obviously to get the most strength, you need to have a joint move through its full range of motion, okay? And if you're unable to do that because of stiffness, you need to address the stiffness before you address the strength, okay? And so stretching is a big deal, and it should be done by a physical therapist or a physician should guide you, I think, um, and, or a very good massage therapist, I think, is another good option. Uh, and then obviously yoga. So if you have a really good yogi who can see like when you do reverse triangle that you can't touch the floor with your hand, they should work you through progressions to get to that point where your adductors are loose enough, the lumbosacral fascia is loose enough, and your hamstrings loose enough. Um, stretching is pretty important. Um, I like yoga because it's so balanced, um, but I think if you see a really good physical therapist, they can help you and they can use adjunctive techniques like dry needling and deep tissue massage to help you. But muscle tightness is a huge source of pain. And then trigger points. So now we're on muscle, obviously. So you can have weak muscles, tight muscles with tendon contractures associated probably, or you get trigger points. Trigger points are forgotten by most orthopedic surgeons, I'll tell you. Massage therapists know about these and physical therapists do, and they're very, very common and a huge source of pain. But for some reason, physicians forget that muscle is maybe the most of us, if that makes sense. So your dry weight, net, net, muscle is one of the biggest parts of you. So obviously it's gonna be a source of pain. Trigger points are little small areas of muscles that hypercontract or they contract pathologically, like when they're not supposed to be contractile, and they just kind of have this tetany, this constant contraction to the point where sometimes they'll become fibrotic, and then guess what happens to the muscle all around it? Everything becomes dysfunctional. And then what's passing through muscles, nerves. So if you have a good enough trigger point and it's close enough to a nerve, you're going to have severe pain and it might radiate and it might refer to somewhere else. You'll have knots and lumps. Most people get a bad trigger point right here, right above the scapula, super common in the upper trap. Um, the infraspinatus in the shoulder, some people will get them in the leg. And we're gonna talk, this picture shows you. So down the lateral hamstring are those black dots. A lot of people will get a trigger point in their medial gastroc, right where I told you that tennis knee was at that my myotennis junction, that's a green dot. And then trigger points where the gluteus medius and minimus stabilize the hip, which connect to the IT band, which connects to the lateral knee. So you always have to think about trigger points and then treat them because if you can get a trigger point to calm down, physical therapy goes so much better and the pain will get better because the, the person can rehab what we call the kinetic chain, the lumbosacral fascia all the way down to the plantar fascia. We can get that working better. So these are very tender spots in your muscle. They radiate, they hurt with motion, they hurt with use, and sometimes they'll actually twitch. We have a comment. Hold on. Oh, somebody just said thank you for the talk and information. I, what was it? Lorraine. I'm sorry. Lorraine, thank you. It was a great comment. Um, Lorraine likes the information and she is taking turmeric with PEA and ginger. That's one of um, the products that I have for joint health, for arthritis. So that's great. That works by reducing inflammation, sort of a different mechanism than what you think of as ibuprofen and Celebrex. It um, turns down the signal of a gene, how can I say this, a translational factor that turns on inflammation called NFKB or um, NF-kappa beta. And so turmeric will downregulate that as will ginger. And so it treats inflammation without doing all the bad things that ibuprofen and um, Mobic and Celebrex and whatnot do. So no damage to the gut biome, no risk of our, um, gastritis or bleeding ulcers and no kidney issues. So that's awesome. I'm glad, I'm glad it's helping you. Next. Okay. So this is from a textbook that I have. Um, Lavelle, and I can't remember, I'm sorry. This is one of the seminal textbooks. On, when I got this textbook from a physical therapist who used to work with me, this just opened my eyes to a whole new world because guess what? They didn't teach us this either in medical school or orthopedic residency. But muscle is a huge source of pain. So if you start to understand the muscle anatomy and 
remember I showed you the pictures of all the nerves coming down the knee. So that bottom left picture, remember that picture of the nerve and superimpose that over this picture of the muscle. And you can see how a tight contractile muscle that's releasing fluid, releasing lactate, um, having inflammation in the area, how that might irritate a nerve root coming down and cause pain and radiate. So this, these diagrams show you how certain trigger points, what their common referral patterns are, okay? So like the bottom left one now, if you look at that X on the top where it has TRP2, so trigger point, that's the, um, I'm sorry, that's the VMO or the vastus medialis coming down. If you have a trigger point there, it can radiate the pain, the brain's perception, because remember pain is just neural circuits firing in a certain way. So if you get a trigger point in just the right spot, your brain is gonna feel this whole string of pain. Same thing in the middle picture, sort of in the upper side, you get a gluteus medius trigger point up there in the butt and it can radiate. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. So sometimes patients will come see me, I'll find a trigger point and if you press it, it will radiate and they can feel it somewhere else or it reproduces sort of their whole global pain. So if you can understand this muscle thing, which again, a lot of massage therapists are really good with this as our physical therapists, then what I do is I'll do trigger point injections. So I'll find the trigger point, that hypercontractile muscular element, and I'll go in and I'll put, usually I do lidocaine and Tordon B12 for people to just, because most people are B12 deficient, it's good for muscle and good for nerves. And then Tordol is like a liquid anti-inflammatory, but it stays just in that area. And then lidocaine numbs it up. So this is, a, this is a huge source of problems throughout the body, especially the spine. So back pain, neck pain, a lot of it's trigger points. Um, and you can see how it radiates. So how the neural circuits connect to muscle contractile elements to create this perception of a string of pain or radiating pain, which can be misinterpreted as a nerve root problem. Some people have had trigger points in their legs and they end up getting a lumbar fusion. Well, guess what? They still have the trigger point in their leg. So something to think about. And this just shows you in a little bit more anatomic detail what we're talking about. The middle picture is an electron micrograph of a muscle fiber with that hypercontractile element kind of making it deformed and look funny. And then the cartoon on the right just sort of shows you all the sarcomeres are where the muscles slide against each other to, to shorten and lengthen a muscle. They just get locked up and they don't stop. Like the actin doesn't let go of the myosin. Um, it's like tetany is the word for sustained contraction. And there's a number of ways to treat this, deep tissue massage, dry needling, stretching, stretch and relax, cupping, trigger point injections. Another question or comment. The question is, how do I feel about acupuncture? I love acupuncture. One of the doctors that comes and works in my clinic, Dr. Anderson, she does acupuncture. Acupuncture is obviously got time on its side. It's been practiced for thousands of years very successfully. Acupuncture is a little bit different than what I'm talking about with dry needling. So dry needling, you use an acupuncture needle and you go right into the trigger point. Acupuncture would use more of those lines that I told you about. They say chi or energy kind of pathways, but really what they're following are the neural circuitries, okay? So you can, based on brain mapping of pain and like how your brain perceives things versus anatomy, that's probably what chi ultimately comes down to. So for instance, you can treat chronic pain with acupuncture in the uh, upper ear oracle, okay, believe it or not. And there's actually some clinical trials going on at one of the big total joint hospitals in New York right now using that during surgery to reduce post-op narcotic pain use. Acupuncture is awesome. It works great. You have to find somebody that really knows what they're doing. Um, but it, but it, I think, works partly, and I'm no expert because I'm not trained in acupuncture, um, the neural circuitries plus the fascial connections plus how pain radiates with the muscles is how it works, but it does work well. Okay. Okay. And this is what I'm talking about, kinetic chain. So these images are from a great textbook I have that was written actually by a massage therapist of the fat anatomy trains or fascial lines. So these are actual, this has been proven in human cadaveric dissections and clinical studies, connections through the body, linear connections that do not end and stop. So there is, so this is one of the problems in medicine today. So a lot of patients come to see me and they say, look, I got a neck guy, I got an elbow guy, I got a shoulder guy, I got a knee guy, I got an ankle guy, and I'm tired of seeing all these different guys. Can you put it all together? 
and I like to think I could at least try to do it. <clears throat> and this is one of the ways I know how to do it. So you can see this back superficial back line will connect from the occiput through the neck fascia to the fascia by the scapula, go down the fascia by the latissimus dorsi, which is your big shoulder muscle, like the Michael Phelps muscle, <clears throat> connects to the lumbosacral fascia to the IT band to wear the lateral knee. So you could release a lateral knee pain anywhere along that fascial connection and then flip it. you got the front spiral line. So remember when you, the human body doesn't just walk. You're not a robot. You rotate, right? So that's why spinal motion is so important. So every time you take a step, you're not just deviating a little bit like this. You're rotating. And how do you do that? How is everything connected? Through spiral lines of fascia, totally connected totally important and needs to be understood to fully rehab somebody, especially for knee pain. So the fascia lata is sort of that deep investing, the sock-like fascia we talked about, becomes thick on the side of the knee to the IT band, and then also goes up to the tensor fascia lata and the gluteus medius and minimus, and then follows the lumbosacral fascia. It'll actually follow it to the opposite shoulder. So you could have a lateral knee problem associated with a right shoulder problem, left knee, right shoulder. Why? Because of these kinetic chains these anatomy trains. It's pretty amazing if you think about it. And so if you can get this all working correctly, you'll feel better, you'll uh, perform better, and your joints will function much better. And you'll be able to handle the stress thrown to you by life a little bit better. So next. And this sort of shows you. The reason I put, these are different lines. This is an anatomic dissection showing you the fascia going from the lateral ankle, the perineals, connected to the lateral knee, connected to the IT band, connected to the lateral hip, connected to the lumbosacral, connected to all the oblique muscles in your core, connected to the lat, connected to the shoulder. So it's pretty awesome how the human body puts this all together. The reason I put this baseball picture here to show you, so you guys have probably all heard the, the Tommy John surgery where they repair this one little certain ligament in the elbow and base, I can't look, I can't even rotate my arm the way a baseball pitcher does. They go back so far and they come so fast. There's so much force and velocity. A lot of them will get a tear of this. Remember we talked about sprains and strains of the ulnar collateral ligament. But what we've learned over the years is that the guys that have the littlest or the, that have less hip motion, where they don't rotate their pelvis right and their lumbosacral spine, those are the guys that are more prone to getting the ulnar collateral ligament injury in a Tommy John because they can't, they can't use their spiral lines and rotate to get the force from their core to throw the ball. It's all going through their elbow. So turns out to rehab an elbow, you got to rehab the hips. So how cool is that? Next. All right, we have a question that my producer is unsure if I'll be able to answer. Let's see. Read it again. Pain going. Pain that goes down the sides of your arms and legs. Okay. Okay. So the question is, what if I have pain going down the sides, which I assume they're saying here, of my arms and legs, including my knees, and the skin is tender to touch? Well, again, that could be the nervous system, any of the muscles. It could be coming from nerve roots to your limbs. But think about this. What are the odds of having the same disc, spinal disc, that would affect the side of your arms and your legs exactly the same way. The odds are so low, it's probably impossible. So when I hear these kind of things, I start thinking about systemic connective tissue or autoimmune type problems or things like fibromyalgia, which is um, on the continuum of what we call central sensitization syndromes. What does that mean? It means that the neural circuits in the brain that connect to all of this they're just, they have different thresholds. So like a light touch will hurt somebody with a condition like that where it shouldn't. And so you have to retrain the neural circuits or there's some meds like Pristique is a great med for that. Not saying that's what you have, but it, it could be anything along that continuum of connective tissue disorders or nervous system sensitization disorders. When you have that sort of multifocal symmetric pain kind of everywhere and where light touch hurts, that's what I would start to, I would start to go down that diagnostic path. One more question. Another long one. Hold on. How 
Okay, so the question is from somebody who says her orthopedic surgeon dismissed her or blew her off because she didn't, she wasn't quite ready for a knee replacement. So the orthopedic surgeon wanted to, that's what they do. Um, so how does this person find a physical therapist or massage therapist that is knowledgeable and skilled here? Unfortunately, that is a that is the question. Uh, it's mostly word of mouth. Uh, you just got to go talk to people. Um, I tend to, so a lot of patients come see me from all over. Um, my area, I'm in Baton Rouge, but I'll see people from Mississippi, North Louisiana, whatever. They'll come find me. And um, and this is probably, I don't even know if this is a great rule of thumb, but one thing I'll do is I'll try to lead them to that. If, if they're near an academic center that has a sports team, a lot of times those physical therapists are so into the anatomy and the athletic ability that they're pretty deeply knowledgeable. So I try to get them hooked up with those kind of physical therapists. Um, go ahead. Oh, yeah. And I would say an independent massage therapist or one not involved in a chain. Um, you know, like like let's say in my clinic, if if I had a massage therapist, obviously I'm not going to hire somebody that doesn't understand all of this. But like a massage envy or a chain like that, they might not they might just hire whoever is willing to work at this point. Right. So an independent massage therapist with a good reputation, probably not fresh out of school. Um, Maybe ask if you can talk to other patients, although that's always awkward because of all the federal privacy laws. Um, that's a great question. I don't have a great answer for you. It's really just word of mouth. So like, for instance, I know who's a good PT in North Louisiana now. I know who's good in New Orleans, but I've learned this over the years. Like I know who are the good massage therapists in my town, um, but I don't know who's a good massage therapist in San Antonio. You know what I mean? Yeah, if you find a naturopath or a, a functional medicine physician, they tend to be more in tune with this kind of stuff rather than just big pharma and surgery. Um, so maybe find a functional medicine practitioner or a naturopath and ask them who they use for massage therapy. That might be a good way to go. Okay, so meniscal. So if you're if you haven't been told to if you haven't been told that you're bone on bone, you've probably been told you have a meniscal tear. And I'm going to tell you how uh, it's probably true and why that's kind of a trick um, later. Trick's probably pejorative, I shouldn't say that. But here's your meniscus. So the left picture, see where it says femur? So this is coronal cross sections. Now, now it's like you've sliced like this. So we're looking at a cross section, you're looking at the femur. There's that thin, beautiful cartilage layer, cartilage there, tibia. Well, between the two is the meniscus, which is, remember that picture of the semicircular thing? I, I call it gristle. You know, when you eat chicken or steak, or whatever, there's always that piece of gristle. That's sort of what these things feel like in real life, like when you're in there operating um, or doing a dissection. But it's basically a wedge just like that. It narrows out as it goes into the knee. The outside has blood flow, so the outside can heal. The middle of the meniscus has a little bit of blood flow, so there's a chance it can heal. The very inside usually has no blood flow, so it's difficult for that to heal if it's torn. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But you can see how close it is to the medial collateral ligament. And then what's not in this picture? You're right. Nerves, blood vessels, coral fascia, muscle, and then all the other little random ligaments we talked about. That's the medial meniscus. On the left is the lateral meniscus, which is, again, the outside of the knee. So that's the top part of... So your lower ankle bone on the outside is your fibula. Well, that bone extends up the entire length of your shin and attaches to your knee. So that's actually another joint in your knee between the fibula and the proximal tibia. And big hamstring tendon connects there, lateral collateral ligament. A bunch of things connect on the proximal fibula, but right above it is the lateral meniscus. Most tears are medial meniscus. Again, remember most people are a little bit barris with 60% of the weight going through the medial meniscus, but some people will tear lateral meniscus. Okay, so there are different types of tears, and I pulled this off of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery website, um, and I'm going to tell you why this is important in a second, but you've got a bucket handle tear there on the far left picture, so see how it's no longer a semicircle, but it's got a hole in the middle of it, so they call that a bucket, bucket handle, then you've got a parrot beak tear, then you've got a radial tear, meaning it's radial so circle if you go this way is the radius so it's a radial tear and then you have a complicated degenerative tear most tears nowadays that we see if it's not a young athlete that got injured in a game usually the tears are degenerative or from chronic inflammation oxidative stress on the far right so go next so why do we care because we classify these things and poor residents in uh, lsu where i teach 
they get questioned on this stuff and heckled if they don't get it right. Was that a radial tear? What kind of tear is that? What are you going to use? Why does it matter? This, because we can fix these now. We never used to be able to fix them. But now certain types of tears, if they have a certain pattern and they're in an area with some blood flow, we can actually do a knee scope now and put a stitch in it and fix it. Why is that important? Because back in the day, like 60s, 70s, maybe even the 80s, if you had a meniscal tear, your orthopedic surgeon would go in and literally re remove the whole meniscus. Well, that turned out to be a disaster. Everybody had to get a total knee because we need the meniscus. Not only is it cushioning and keeping the cartilage from slamming on cartilage, but it's providing rotational control. So it limits the shear stresses across cartilage, across the top of cartilage. So that was a bad idea, just like leeches were, another great thing we did in medicine. So we used to take out the whole meniscus. This was before my time. Then it became partial meniscectomies, which are still to date one of the most commonly done surgeries. So we go in and we, like a lot of guys would see that tear on the bottom right picture. And instead of going through all this rigmarole of trying to put a stitch in it, uh, we just cut it out, chop it, smooth the edges of the meniscus and call it a day. That's your so-called partial meniscectomy. Well, we know now that the natural history of that is even bad. So if you even take a portion of the meniscus, you are hastening the progression of arthritis in a lot of cases. Not 100%, but a lot. So like I try to get people to heal every meniscal tear naturally, if at all humanly possible, because long term, we're talking five, 10 years out, those people do better because they still have their meniscus. But this is why we care what type of tear and why we characterize it. Um, but if you do have a meniscal tear in a certain pattern and you have failed, like, I don't know, four to six months of actual good non-operative treatment, then this is an option because you could preserve your meniscus. We have a question. Okay, so this person is asking, they have a Baker cyst. Remember I showed you where that exits the knee. So it actually goes out the back. Usually they're associated with a meniscal tear and a capsule tear, and they exit between the tendon to the gastroc and the hamstring tendon. So they have a Baker cyst. They had a partial meniscectomy, and they wonder why their knee is stiff. Um, and they've been told they have mild arthritis. So our way of grading arthritis is not amazing. We have mild, moderate, and severe. So, I mean... That doesn't sound very scientific, am I right? Um, most arthritis starts before we can even sense it because it's really a biomechanical, chronic inflammation, oxidative stress problem. So it's already starting in the synovial joint, in the capsule, in the ligaments, in the uh, subchondral plate, um, and in the cartilage well before any doctor could remotely detect it on a radiograph or x-ray. So the stiffness, I would say, could be all that other stuff we talked about. You could have improper proprioception where your joints just not moving correctly because the neural circuits are messed up. You could have um, a tendon contracture. You could have a ligament contracture. Your capsule could just be tight. You might have muscle weakness. Your hamstring might be stiff in the proximal aspect, which isn't letting your knee move correctly. Or you have scar tissue from the meniscectomy or the meniscectomy propagated arthritis. Maybe you got moderate arthritis in that knee compartment and mild in the other one, okay? Or your tendons and ligaments are just getting stiff through the deposition of these monster proteins that happen called advanced glycation end products that happen to us through diet and through even low level hyperglycemia over years. This is one of the reasons why getting off of sugar is hugely important because then you won't have these monster proteins glom on to the collagen bundles. So like I said, there's about a gazillion reasons you might be stiff. Um, I would probably find a good, good, somebody that understands all this anatomic detail and try to try to get it sorted out. And it really, I think it comes down to a really, like I have such good physical therapists on my team and we work together in the same building. I showed you my clinic. We talk about people, we have conferences. I'll go see with them. We've done educational series with each other. Um, I think that's kind of important to have a really good physical therapist that works closely with whoever's diagnosing you um, to really get to the nuts and bolts of why you're stiff. Cause it could be anything. Next. Oh, we have another question if you guys don't mind. Go ahead. Having bone to bone left knee issues, including stretched ACL and MCL, um, doesn't want a knee replacement, and they're already strengthening the muscles above and below their knee, but they still have a major scar pain. Okay, so this person has been told they have bone on bone and a stretched ACL and MCL. 
Um, and they're working on their muscle strength, but they still have severe sharp pain, but they don't want a totally arthroplasty and I don't blame them. We're going to talk about why later. So this kind of chronic arthritic based knee pain, these are the, and I'm just, obviously I haven't examined your, that's my whole history right there, but chronic knee pain in the setting arthritis and somebody that does not want surgery or is not a candidate for surgery. In my practice, those are the people that I really strongly consider a peripheral nerve stimulator for because you can treat the pain. You can still keep doing the rehab. You can still keep getting more flexible and stronger, but you don't have to have surgery because guess what? Your brain is not perceiving the pain. That neural circuit has been overwhelmed by the peripheral nerve stimulator. So that's one option. I maybe, maybe a lot of people don't really know how to put those in. So I don't know if your particular physician does, but you probably could find someone in your area to at least do a consultation about that. I wanted this in here because this is a problem I see in medicine all the time. Uh, oh, I have a disc. My doctor told me I have a disc. My doctor told me I have arthritis. Oh, I have a meniscal tear. Well, that's great, but so does everybody else. And it doesn't mean that's why you hurt. And this is how I know this. This is just one of probably 30 studies that I've read that in various body parts, because they've done this now for the neck, thoracic, lumbar spine, shoulder, knee, ankle, hip. So they take a group of people that have no pain, do MRIs and see what does the MRI show us. Well, guess what? Now, and note here, it says adults using 3.0 Tesla MRI. When MRIs first came out, they were like 1.2 Tesla. That's the size of the magnet, the power of the magnet. Most are 1.5 Tesla. If you can get a 3.0 Tesla, the, the images are amazing, like, like just magical, the anatomic detail. So this study looked at 230 people with no knee pain with a 3.0 Tesla MRI. And guess what? 100% of the 230 people had an abnormality found on their MRI. Think about that. So this is what, when I said trick before, which was probably just too negative a board, anytime a doctor gets an MRI, you're going to be able to find an indication to do a procedure. I guarantee you. And this is a study amongst others that shows you that 30% with an average age of 44, 30% had meniscal tears. So you have knee pain and you're 40. There's a one out of three chance a meniscal tear is going to be found. Well, is that really why you have knee pain? Well, I just gave you about 100 other reasons you might have knee. And we know that this is 230 people with no pain, and a third of them had a meniscal tear. Are they all going to go get a knee scope and get a partial meniscectomy, which I already told you is going to cause arthritis? This is the problem with advanced imaging that we have now. And areas that have more MRIs and more physician-owned MRIs, believe it or not, are areas that have more procedures done, because you're always going to find something. It's especially true in the spine. 57%, think about this, 230 people with no pain, 60%, two thirds had patellofemoral joint issues. What are you, you gonna go get a total knee? Cause you gotta, my knee hurts in the front doctor and my MRI now has a patellofemoral joint problem. Well, what about the patellar tendon? What about the nerves across the front of the knee? What about the medial patellofemoral ligament? What about the curl fascia? None of that's thought about. Once you get an MRI and it says meniscal tear, that's what everybody sort of hones in on. So I just put this in here to, to let you know that there are a lot of people with no pain walking around that have arthritis on imaging, that have meniscal tears, that have cartilage tears, name it. It's there. They just don't feel it. So IT band, we've been talking about that a lot. I just wanted to show you a picture. Remember, that goes from the hip, invests a lot of the muscle on the side of the leg, and connects to the top of the lateral or outside aspect of the shin bone right in front of the fibula. And then the picture on the left, it's sort of like grayed out with a lot of cross hatches. That's that investing coral fascia that just sort of holds everything together like a nice tight leotard almost. And then connects to the fascia underneath, which becomes a little bit thickened in the lines. And the IT band is on the side and you can see it there. So you got your gluteus maximus, your butt muscle, the minimus and medius, you can't really see, the tensor fascia lata coming off the upper top part of your hip, connecting to the IT band, going down to the knee, all connected. This is why hip rehab is so important for the knee and the ankle, actually. This anatomic dissection, imagine that middle picture. They just took a square and cut it and flipped it. That's what they're showing you here. All of these thick, thick connections of this IT band to the femur bone and to the joint capsule. So it's a very important structure for stability of the outside of the knee joint when you're walking to keep you from like shucking and falling over. Common, common, common source of pain, lateral knee pain. I see it all the time. 
and this just shows you the structures that are under the IT band that could also be um, involved. That thing that says Gertie's tubercle, that is where the IT band connects, okay? And then so every time your, knee, your femur flexes and extends, we, we always think of and say that it's snapping over the femur, but I just showed you the anatomic dissection that shows it's actually connected to the femur. So it's actually moving with the femur. It's probably pulling on all of those minor ligaments and capsule, and that's the source of the pain. A lot of people with severe lateral knee pain, I'll give them an, a distal IT band injection in that area, usually with Tordal because I don't like steroids because it genetically changes the fibrocytes and whatnot, um, and then send them to therapy. And most people will get better because my therapist will work the whole kinetic chain and all the fascial interconnections. But IT bands, super common in runners. Now, arthritis. So this is going to get, this is a lot of, of topic. The picture on the right that says aging extracellular signaling and then aging phenotype, this is all the biomechanical stuff that we only now are understanding to be the true source of arthritis. So remember the beginning of the talk, I showed you the common reasons people think that arthritis happens, wear and tear, overuse, oh, you're just old. Well, what does that even mean you're just old? Well, now we know that old means an accumulation of problems from a lifetime of chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, and I think deposition of advanced glycation end products. So what happens is you get mitochondrial dysfunction in the chondrocytes and in the capsule cells and in the synovial lining. The mitochondria, remember from other talks, is the engine of the cells or the refinery. So the mitochondria takes in the glucose that is from the food you ate and refines it and makes ATP, which is your usual usable fuel source. So that's what the cells run on. They don't run on hamburgers, right? They run on ATP. So somewhere between what you put in your mouth to what the cells use, there's this whole chemical conversion refining process. The mitochondria is integral to that. If your mitochondria becomes dysfunctional because of too many reactive oxygen species, which are free radicals, and if you go back and watch the talk on oxidative stress, we get into probably way too much detail about that, um, and chronic inflammation. So your fuel cells stop functioning properly, and then the whole thing falls apart. The cartilage doesn't work right. Synovial lining doesn't work right. Your fibrocytes don't work right. The bone forming cells don't work right. And the inflammation just gets thrown all apart. And that's the true source of arthritis. Very rarely is it actually truly uh, a true like crack through the cartilage or an impact injury to the cartilage. Because most people develop arthritis um, all over, not just an injured joint, okay? The picture on the left, I love this picture because it shows you how RC arthritis is right in there with rheumatoid arthritis. It's just on a continuum. So the normal sera, so that's when they take blood markers, so blood from somebody that has no rheumatoid arthritis, no osteoarthritis, supposedly healthy, right? That shows you it's all yellow and blue, not a lot of inflammation. The blood from a, somebody with osteoarthritis under OA sera starts to become a little bit more red, but then look at the synovial fluid from somebody from arthritis. So this is a lot of the studies that have been looking at um, Arthritis, as it relates to chronic inflammation and oxidative stress, they just look at blood markers. They're not really doing true synovial cell markers. But you can see how close the synovial cell is to the rheumatoid synovial cell in terms of levels of inflammation. Okay, so really this is an inflammatory problem. It's just on a continuum. It's another, um, it's another what we call non-communicable disease. Diabetes, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, cancers, um, neurodegenerative problems, all of these are lifestyle diseases, meaning we kind of do it to ourselves, more or less. Now, there are some genetic polymorphisms, of course. I'm not going to poo-poo that. But by and large, if we would just limit the inflammation, so the guy in the beginning who said he was cutting out sugar and white flour, I mean, that's awesome. Those are primary sources of this. So if we could just limit that and get enough antioxidants on board to tamp down the oxidative stress, we are going to be much better off and be way closer to the blue and yellow um, and less like the rheumatoid serum fluid there or synovial fluid. So next slide. Mitochondria we talked about. The right picture shows you the electron transport chain. Very complicated, but very awesome. <clears throat> so the body will take electrons, <clears throat> excuse me, from what's called the Krebs cycle. So when you eat, I don't know why this water is. <clears throat> excuse me. I know it's terrible. They're so mad at me. So like, let's say I ate a banana. That's going to be converted to different molecules, uh, or glucose, we'll say, that goes into what's called the Krebs cycle. And at each stage, a different carbon molecule is pulled off and an electron is pulled off and put onto um, 
something called NADPH or NAD, which is why if you're into anti-aging or longevity, you're hearing so much about NAD now. We're going to talk about that at my next webinar. NAD transfers the electron from the Krebs cycle to the, to the electron transport chain. And then those electrons pass in and out of these cytochromes on the membranes inside the mitochondria. And as they pass through, they create a gradient. The energy from that electron is used to put a lot of protons on one side and no protons in the other side. And nature does not like anything that's not balanced. So eventually it wants to equalize this. This is how osmosis works. So what happens is the protons all drop through this one uh, enzyme in the cell membrane called ATPase, and it acts like a turbine. The protons drop down, the turbine spins, and you throw out ATP or usable energy. That is your refinery. That's on the right. That's what gets messed up with arthritis. So cartilage requires energy. It doesn't have its own blood flow. It usually gets it through diffusion or a process called glycolysis, which is a little bit different than this. This process on the right requires oxygen, okay? which means blood flow. So mitochondria make the ATP, cartilage uses glycolysis, but all of the structures around the cartilage are doing the ATP, the electron transport chain. If that gets messed up because of chronic inflammation and oxidative stress, then all of the bioenergetics of the cell get messed up. The signaling molecules aren't made properly. Proteins aren't folded properly. Properly, DNA gets mutated or one DNA gets turned on when it should have been turned off and one gets turned off when it should have been turned on, so on and so forth. And then you start to break down and you get arthritis. And then this picture on the left just shows you a cross section through cartilage. Look how great that is. It's just layers of chondral cells with this matrix around each cell and it sort of transitions down to bone and then interdigitates with the bone. That is what lines all of your joints. And then above that is a joint fluid and around that is a joint capsule or the synovial lining. All of this is so complex and works together so tightly. This is why it's so important to just stay healthy because there's no way that we can manage all of this with like just one drug, right? You can't take an ibuprofen and fix this. Um, it's just a beautiful system that we need to take care of a little bit better. Go on. Okay, cell senescence. I don't know if anybody's into longevity and anti-aging like, like I am, um, but cell senescence is one of the sources of what we think of as aging. So what? So normally a cell will replicate itself. It'll divide and go on, divide and go on, divide and go on, and sort of clone itself. And, and in perpetuity, you would think, but they have found a natural limit of that number of divisions, and then, and then a cell will just stop dividing. But it doesn't necessarily die. It'll become what's called senescent. Now, some senescent cells are meant to be that way, and it's a good thing. Some are senescent just because the system got messed up with the oxidative stress or the extra free radicals or the chronic inflammation. And those senescent cells, which are a cell that was supposed to keep dividing, didn't, but wasn't programmed to stop and sit there inertly, those start to pump out what's called the senescence-associated secretory phenotype. These words are horrible, I know. But basically, it just sits there and it keeps producing inflammation and oxidative stress all around it and damages more of the cells around it. And, and it's just a sort of cascade. So a lot of the research going on right now in longevity and anti-aging is trying to control, prevent, or modulate these senescent cells somehow, either through sirtuins or mTOR um, <clears throat> or different ways to manage mitochondrial health with like AMPK and things like metformin and rapamycin. Hugely important, but a lot of arthritis is because of this. Your AMPK balances off. What's AMPK? That is a little enzyme that senses when you're in a low energy state, um, when you have too many adenosine monophosphates, and it'll put your cell into a higher energy state, start cleaning up the mitochondria, getting rid of poorly folded proteins, repair DNA. This is why metformin helps cartilage health so much because it's an AMPK balancer. And berberine, which is an herb, also does what metformin does for your AMPK balance and, and promotes longevity and cellular uh, cleanup, I guess you could think of it. It's like maintenance, like a maintenance enzyme. Um, and it makes your bioenergetics better. So like there's actually a study out of Singapore. It's a great study. They looked at groups of people over time um, that were scheduled for a total knee and then whether did they or didn't they go on a total knee. And this was in one particular population of diabetics. And they found that the group that was on metformin and Celebrex delayed their need for total knee by about six years relative to the other group of people. So a lot of times that's a great combination for somebody that's on the way but really doesn't want a total knee. If, if you can make the cartilage healthier at the cellular level by improving the AMPK levels and then reducing oxidative stress, um, 
then you can really help them prevent that need. So like the person that doesn't want a total knee who's got that mild arthritis, these are the things you got to start thinking about. Like maybe you should be on berberine because um, likely no doctor is going to give you metformin because A, your insurance won't pay for it because the indication is for diabetes or B, you don't really want it on your record because then everybody's going to think you're diabetic even though you're not diabetic. So there's a lot of stuff going on with the anti-aging world, which is effectively making our ability to treat all of these non-communicable chronic diseases better. So because it's all the same problem, too much chronic inflammation, too much oxidative stress, messed up DNA because the DNA cleanup team is not doing their job correctly. And there's a number of members of that team, sirtuins, mTOR, AMPK, etc. cetera. <clears throat> Go ahead. So like everything else in the world, you got to get it just right. So let's, we're going to talk about activity now and arthritis. So when I was a resident and in medical school, and even I want to say up until probably this year, literally, almost every other doctor would tell people after an injury or after surgery, oh, you got You can't do anything. You can sit there. You can't risk injury. Oh you, oh, you were in a car accident? You just have to sit on the couch. Well, turns out that's like the worst thing you can do to the human body. Too little atrophy, I mean, too little activity automatically means your cartilage will become atrophic, diseased, and break down. It has to sense mechanical movement, has to sense gravity. It needs diffusion of liquid. The body was meant to be in motion. <clears throat> the cartilage will thin. You'll get decreased amounts of what are called proteoglycans, which are molecules that hold hydration. And basically, you're more prone to injury. So not good. So you can't do too little. Well, if you do too much, let's say you're, um, you like to run 100 mile endurance runs. There are these people. Um, very strenuous activity like that, if, particularly if you have a little bit of a malalignment, can lead to damage over time. Um, or like, let's say you're a skydiver, or you like CrossFit, or you like MMA. Things like that, where you're putting your joints through really bizarre range of motions that you're not used to, that can be a problem. What is just right? What's been shown over and over and over again? And honestly, if you find a doctor that says this isn't true, um, maybe show them the literature. Moderate activity is what you need to not only prevent arthritis, but to treat it. It increases your cartilage thickness. It increases proteoglycan content. It increases overall mechanical stiffness, so the biomechanical properties, rehabs the muscles. It gets the flexibility back, and it stimulates healing. A little bit of stress in the body, it's called hormesis. A little bit of stress stimulates those cleanup, those maintenance systems. So damaged mitochondria is chewed up and thrown out. Proteins that were folded wrong are chewed up and thrown out or folded correctly. DNA that was damaged is repaired, but you cannot get any of those responses in your body unless you stress your body out a little bit. Activity and exercise is one of the ways to do that. We have some more bone on bone questions. Everybody loves that. Okay, the question is, if you were told you were bone on bone, do you have any cartilage? I don't know. Like I said, I've had enough people come in my office that were told they were bone on bone, and I take a series of x-rays, and I still see a joint space. So my opinion, that person's not bone on bone, but I'm not sure what information the person before that said bone on bone was going on. Um, you can get... MRIs done with cartilage specific sequencing to really tell, or you can do what's called an MR arthrogram where you inject dye into the joint and then they shoot the MRI and it'll actually show, show you if you have a cartilage surface or if there's any irregularities or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think being told bone on bone is pretty common. Um, and in some cases you might be, but again, there's enough people bone on bone walking around with no pain that I can't really say that that's the true source of pain. A lot of times I'll do what's called a spec scan, which is a combination of a bone scan with a CT. So the bone scan shows you where there's osteoblasts actively turning over bone. And so if that area where somebody's bone on bone lights up on the spec scan, I can be reasonably assured that that is the true source of pain. But sometimes it doesn't light up. Carol wants to know if I can give an example of moderate exercise. Yeah, so the recommendations are zone two. So zone one, two, three, four. So zone two is you're, you're walking, let's say, but fast enough that it's a little bit hard to have a conversation, but you could have a conversation, but it's kind of uncomfortable. That's zone two cardio. That's your moderate exercise. That's what you need to be doing about 30 minutes a day, about five days a week if you can. 
So, and, and guess what? It's not just good for arthritis. It prevents cognitive decline, prevents all cause mortality from cardiovascular disease, prevents diabetes. Every time you're active, it pulls glucose out of your blood system. So it prevents the deposition of those advanced glycation end products. So exercise is probably after nutrition or in conjunction with nutrition and sleep, the best medicine you could ever give yourself. So zone two cardio, if your joints are, you know, I always get patients that tell me they hurt too much. They can't, they can't walk. Um, then I would try walking in a pool because that offloads the weight off of the joint, but you can still have resistance and still get that zone two. Cycling, um, elliptical, anything like that that takes a little bit of pressure off the joint but lets you move is going to be beneficial. And even if you're not mechanically loading the knee, the act of exercise, all of the systemic things that happen, even hormonal changes like increases in growth hormone and things that promote healing and repair, all of that will get better and the knee should in theory get better. It's usually about five, I know it sounds like a lot, but once you start doing it, it's really not. It's a 30 minute walk, even a 20 minute walk. But look, if you can't do five days a week, that doesn't mean don't do one day a week, even one day a week is better than nothing. You just gotta start somewhere. Now this is why I think that it's important and I know a few of you out there based on the questions, also understand this intrinsically, why you don't want to just jump to a total knee. So let's go see, you see someone, they say your bone on bone, your knee hurts. And then next thing you know, you're signed up for a total knee replacement. Well, okay. Why would you maybe not want to do that? 20% of people, the bottom here, 20% of total knee patients are still not happy, still have pain, still have problems. Okay. Your surgeon will tell you there's a 95 to 97% survivorship rate that total needs to do great. And uh, what they're talking about is everything up to actually having to do a surgery to go in and remove the total knee, okay? If you don't go that far in the world of orthopedic surgery, that's a good result. So 95% do that. You don't have to actually remove the total knee and replace it. But that group of people, 20% are totally not happy. And they come see me all the time and they have a variety of different reasons they hurt. This top right shows you a spec scan. We just talked about a spec scan. So on this image, I would be able to tell that this person really has a problem under that tibial base plate on their partial knee replacement. Probably it's a little bit loose, if not infected. So it, you, it almost gives you a target of where the bone activity is. So it's a beautiful study to do for unclear sources of knee pain. But look at this differential here on the left. Entrant and table one. This is from a um, article out of our, our um, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery trade journal. Intrinsic, extrinsic, and rare causes of pain after total knee. Look at all of these reasons. Infection, implant loosening, catastrophic failure, knee instability, extensor mechanism disorders, arthrofibrosis, hip pathology, spine pathology. Well, they probably had the hip pathology and the spine pathology before they did the total knee. Synovitis, recurrent hemarthrosis, that's bleeding in the joint. Nerve related, hmm, we talked about that. Worker's comp, how about that? That's a cause of knee pain after surgery. And that's, there's a whole field of literature in how worker's comp people tend to do worse in terms of outcomes for a lot of um, surgeries. There's some studies that do not show that, that show the opposite, but by and large, most show that. And I'll leave it up to you to figure that one out. Heterotopic ossification, that's abnormal bone growth and psychiatric disorder. So would you believe this, that most of the outcomes of surgery, ortho, orthopedics is kind of behind the chronic pain literature and really a lot of other medical industries. Um, most pain after a procedure or outcomes is actually more tightly associated with the patient's preoperative status in terms of depression and anxiety than with any technical thing that we do or the type of implant or the rehab or anything. So you have to... You have to control mood and mindset. And there is just a world of literature in the world of mindset. But orthopedic surgeons, we still subscribe to the biomedical concept of disease where, oh, bone broken must fix and think that that's going to solve every problem on the, on the earth. And that's just not true. Mindset's hugely important. Um, all right. I think we've had enough of this slide. It's kind of depressing. But this is, this is why you want to avoid surgery if you can. Now, you may not be able to. You may really be bone on bone, three compartments, tried everything else, failed on operative treatment, have to have a knee replacement. But there's still a 20% chance you might have some issues afterwards. So just keep that expectation in mind. But on the other hand, have a good mindset about it. The more positive you are, the better chance you'll have a good outcome. Oh, we have a comment.
That's the comment? Okay, so the comment is, uh, somebody commented that they have arthritis in the midfoot and are unable to walk and cannot do cardio anymore. So for those cases, I mean, there's things you can do like rocker bottom shoes to offload the midfoot to take stress away when you're ambulating. Or like I said before, walk in the pool or swimming. Swimming is a good way to do cardio where you don't load the midfoot. So you just have to have, again, the right mindset where there's a will, there's a way. There is an exercise for you because if you want to prevent dementia, cognitive decline, atherosclerosis, heart disease, and generally be happy and functional when you get older, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your mindset, exercise is the answer. So think about this. It's free. It's available. It, you can do it on your own time. It's totally within your control. So to me, this is kind of a good thing. This is a medicine you don't have to worry about your insurance covering or not covering. And uh, it's totally empowering. Now, some people look at it like, oh, I have to, I have to exercise. Like it's a job. Like they don't want to do it. So mindset's hugely important there too. But to offload a joint, swimming is obviously the best option. Uh, walking in a pool, second best. If you're waist high, you're 60% unloaded. Chest high, 80% unloaded. Um, so there's a variety of different ways to manage that. This is a great image showing you the progression of arthritis. So from normal to early arthritis to ravaged. And you could just see normal. Well, are they really normal? We don't know. They could be in that very early stage of heightened inflammation, et cetera. But in general, the subsurface of the cartilage looks good. The inner part of the cartilage looks good. The matrix is healthy. The bones look good. The synovial lining is okay. And then remember, these are going to be the people on that, the yellow and blue side of that inflammatory marker square. Early OA, we're starting to get some divots in the cartilage, some erosions. The synovial lining is thickening because it's getting more of those advanced glycation end products. It's filling with fluid and inflammatory mediators. The proteins aren't folding right. Things are just kind of messed up. The bone is getting a little bit weaker. And then later on, you're going to get cysts in the bone, subchondral fracturing, stress fractures. Sometimes these are the people that respond to that, the injection of the subchondroplasty we talked about. And then the cartilage is just um, very irregular and biomechanically dysfunctional. The bottom right shows one way we treat that. This is an ankle. So when you get to the level of the erosions and like what's called an osteochondral defect, sometimes we'll go in with a scope and actually shave and scoop that out. And then there's a few different biologic ways to replace that cartilage. Unfortunately, of course, most of them aren't covered by insurance. <clears throat> so insurance would rather you get an ankle fusion, I guess, or put up with the pain. But there are some ways to sort of surgically treat disc discrete cartilage layers that are available, cartilage problems. Okay, next. Oh, we have a lot of questions. Okay. Um, you recommended eliminating sugar. Also like honey. Okay, we're going to talk about diet in a minute. So the question is that I recommend in cutting out sugars, does that include natural forms like honey? No, but I mean, you don't want honey in excess. Honey is different because it has a lot of what are called polyphenols and different um, molecules that are very helpful for human health. It's all natural form. And, and you don't want table sugar, but if you eat sugar in the form of a whole fruit, like an apple or an orange, where well, you're getting all the fiber, the dietary fiber and the polyphenols and the terpenes and the flavonoids with it. So that's a totally different ball of wax. So some natural sugars are fine. Okay. It's just, you know, everything in moderation, but the big problem in America, the big reason we have non-communicable chronic diseases um, is really sugar. But we're going to talk about diet and, and ways because the whole point of this talk is for me to give you tools that you can use to stay out of my office. So the first one is moderate exercise. We talked about that. And then trying to manage your AMPK and all that health. But we're about to get into the diet, which helps you do all of that. And then flexibility, muscle strength. We talked about all that. Carol asked if 30 minutes on the elliptical would be fine. Yes. So zone one, zone two, that's all you have to do. Some, some authors think zone one is fine. Most tend to go towards zone two. Zone one would just be like a leisurely stroll. Honestly, fidgeting reduces all-cause mortality by 30%. So people that are just like, you know these people, they're just always moving. They talk with their hands. Their foot's always tapping. They're always doing something like this. Those people live longer and better and have less problems because they're moving. Really, you just need to move. So the elliptical is absolutely great. Start there. Another question. Can you stop the progression of midfoot arthritis with exercise? Uh, yes. And I'll tell you why. They've done studies of um, obese people 
So we know that being obese is a source of inflammation. So adipose tissue produces inflammatory mediators. And the rates of arthritis in the knee and the hip of an obese person are also the same rates of arthritis in their hands. So we know it's not a loading phenomenon, it's an inflammatory phenomenon. So if you can control inflammation, it will control it systemically all over the body. Now, if I had a patient that had bad midfoot arthritis and they wanted to exercise, I would probably have them go see my therapist, make sure that um, the Achilles was rehabbed properly, that all of their biomechanics were good, as good as they could be, and then teach them some sort of um, midfoot arch taping to stabilize it. Maybe a little bit of an insert, although I don't want their foot to get weak, and then probably some type of rock or bottom shoe that takes stress off the midfoot with activity. So there are a lot of ways to work around this or tell them to swim or get on the elliptical. But yes, anytime you exercise, you're pulling sugar out of the blood into the muscle, you're reducing inflammation, you're cleaning up all the mitochondria in the body, okay? And you're basically just doing yourself a world of good and it's a systemic good. It's not like if I just did 50 biceps curls and got my biceps big, would it only affect my arm? No, I'm doing things systemically too. All right, we're gonna move on. Okay, next slide. All right, more on arthritis. And I just threw this in here to show you a micrograph, normal on the top left, damaged. And so obviously that looks like it could potentially be painful, right? You're cracked through into the bone. There's probably a ton of inflammatory biomarkers they're not showing on that slide. The one on the left is pretty cool. Look at that, healthy knee surface on the top, arthritic knee surface in the middle, and then the bottom is an arthritic knee on people that they tested paroxetine. That's an antidepressant. So there are a lot of drugs that are out there that have effects biomechanically or bio physiologically through the system that do more than what they were made to do. So this one was probably FDA approved for depression, right? But look what it does to your cartilage. It really thickens it and makes it juicy and look good, huh? This was a UPenn study. So we're, this is where we're kind of going. We're trying to find ways to manage these problems without going in. The best we can do right now, the best orthopedic surgery has to offer you is to cut out your joint and replace it with a metal and plastic sandwich. So I think we should try to do better and we are trying to do better. But I put this bottom picture to show you, sure your cartilage may look like that, but don't forget the nerves. It might be that you could have that piece of cartilage, which might only be one millimeter big in your knee, right? But you could have a saphenous neuritis, which is a true source of your nerve pain. So we got a comment from Kara. Oh, Kara, you missed my talk on uh, biomechanics of running and whatnot. The question was, if you, if I said that an insert could weaken the midfoot, does that mean I think orthotics weaken the foot? In short, um, over time, yes. And um, oh, what's her name? Davis, Irene Davis, a physical therapist that was at University of Delaware, and I think she's now at Harvard and runs a big running center there. She's done a lot of great work on this subject. Um, if you think of it this way, and she had a great slide in a talk I saw once. Let's say I had a neck brace on while I was talking to you right now. Let's say I had it on since I woke up and I wear it till I go to sleep and I wear it for the next month. And then let's say I take it off. Do you think my neck will be strong or weak? It's gonna be weak. Same thing happens as your foot. You have a ton of little tiny muscles in the foot that are very, very important for energy storage like we talked about, as is the plantar fascia and the Achilles tendon. And very important for push off strength and control and proprioception. Um, and general foot function. If you continually wear something that alters your alignment and holds your foot in one single position, yes, over time, obviously, if the muscles aren't being used, they'll get weaker. So I'm a big, we do a lot of foot core strengthening in my physical therapy clinic for people because most Americans do have weak feet and that leads to balance problems and fall problems. So we try to prevent that, especially in our elderly. And foot deformities will do the same thing. So like studies have shown bunions lead to more falls in the elderly population. So foot strength is important, as is knee strength, as we talked about. Next. Is that a real question? Ah. The question is, will the healing sole work with this, with midfoot arthritis, I guess? The healing sole is a flip-flop I designed to treat foot pain. It does have a little bit of a rocker bottom. It's a bit of a stiffer shoe. It does nothing to alter alignment whatsoever. The whole purpose of the way I designed it was to promote natural healing to offload the painful parts and to let your to de-stress the bones and joints and then to let your body work your muscles. So yeah, I, I think it will increase foot strength over time. Most people actually get sore when they first start wearing it. Calf soreness and foot soreness probably for that reason. Next. 
I'm not sure what's happening. Hold on. A lot of questions, but let's go on. So we may get, we may answer them right now. These are your basic things. Rice, you've heard that, R-I-C-E, rest, ice, compression, elevation. General ways to treat knee pain. I once had a prepatellar bursitis where the bursa over my patella got very, very inflamed. And all I did was I took a few anti-inflammatories and iced it and eventually went away um, and uh, got better. Some people you have to have, like drain the fluid. So that might be a time you need to go see your physician. But generally speaking, ice is a great modality. I like to tell people to alternate heat and ice in a lot of cases because heat will um, bring blood to the area and promote healing by way of bringing healing factors through the blood. And then ice calms down inflammation. So if you alter both, also ice numbs all those superficial nerve endings we talked about. Compression is good because it makes, compression works two ways. It makes the muscles more efficient and control swelling. But also, if you've ever had a paper cut or a, a splinter and you notice that you reflexively press your finger and it feels better, that's because the fibers, the alpha fibers that respond to pressure change the neural circuits in the brain so that they don't feel the nociceptive or type C fibers that are the pain. And that's how that peripheral nerve stimulator works. It alters the signaling to the brain so that you don't feel the pain as much as you feel the pressure or the stimulator. So compression is a great trick anti-inflammatories. I'm a big fan of natural anti-inflammatories because they work more systemically. They have fewer side effects. Um, and they just kind of generally make all of your systems healthier to include your brain. Um, but some of the synthetic, I mean, I've prescribed plenty of Celebrex and ibuprofen. So sometimes that synthetic single molecule enzyme blocking drug is needed when you have severe enough pain. And there it is, gentle exercise and motion and a massage. And now you know why massage might really help. Next. Okay, pain meds. So this is just showing you how complicated the topic of pain meds is. So remember I told you everything comes down to neural circuits. So the brain's on top, down on the bottom, you've got a knee with peripheral nociception, the little sensors in the skin. It has to pass through the peripheral nerves, <clears throat> through the dorsal root ganglia to the spinal cord, up the spinal cord to the brain, gets processed in the brain, moves around in different circuits, and then you feel painful. So pain meds will block at any one of these positions. Opioids block centrally, so up in the brain. And so unfortunately, one of the side effects of that is a continual dopamine hit, and then these become addictive. Um, and that's a huge problem in our country right now, as you know. So I'm not a huge fan of narcotics. Um, the pregabalin, that's Lyrica, and medicines like that, they tamp down what's called glutamate, which is the excitable neurotransmitter. So it'll reduce neuropathic type pains. Diclofenac is one of the anti-inflammatories. It blocks um, one of the cyclooxygenase enzymes that converts arachidonic acid into prostaglandins, which induce inflammation and cause pain. Um, so all of these different, what you think of as pain meds, they each work on different parts of this pathway. And it's our job to figure out which combination is best for you, depending on what your true source of pain is. For the knee and the foot and things like that, I'm a huge fan of topicals because they're much safer. Um, but that would be a whole nother topic. So next slide. Okay, fascial pain techniques. So this is the stuff my therapists do for people a lot. So the guy on the top is working the IT band and the hip and probably strengthening the hip muscles. That uh, crazy yoga looking position guy there, he's doing um, probably, it's like a piriformis stretch. The piriformis is a teensy tiny muscle in your pelvis. It sits over top the sciatic nerve. So sometimes what is perceived to be a lumbar radiculopathy is actually a tight piriformis muscle. So that's a great way to treat that. Again, all very interconnected. The middle picture is somebody getting cupping along the IT band. And cupping is a great technique of fascial manual manipulation where it draws in blood and it moves all of those interconnected fascial, um, I guess, connections. It's terrible. It's redundant. But remember I showed you that fascia lata, the, the tight, the hose or the stocking that goes down your whole leg. And then it in, it has interdigitations into all the structures, not just up and down. That's what cupping works on, all of those fascial interconnections. The, the middle picture with all those cords or the leads going off, that's dry needling with electrical stim attached. So these needles go into the certain muscles and then electrically stimulate them to contract. And that's a way to treat myofascial pain or trigger point pain and to rehab a knee that's you know slowly coming back after some type of injury. Deep tissue massage. And then red light therapy on the bottom. There is a ton of literature on the benefits of photobiomodulation because certain wavelengths of light will actually pass through the skin and then affect 
structures underneath, such as the mitochondria or the fibrocytes or the chondrocytes. So red light therapy is a great anodyne therapy, great techniques. So these are all, I'm giving you all the tools you can do short of surgery. Self-treatments. So diet, exercise, sleep, and reducing stress. We talked about mindset. Sleep is hugely important. I think we all know that at this point. We can talk about it more. Diet and exercise. Diet is hugely important for pain of arthritis and for arthritis in and of itself. You are what you eat. And right now, if you're like most Americans, you are a bunch of omega-6s hanging out in your cell membranes. And you're not enough of these guys, EPA and DHA, which are your omega-3s. <clears throat> so icasa pentanoic acid and docosohexanoic acid. Most people just say EPA and DHA. These are your long chain fatty acids that you find in fatty fish like salmon and herring, or you supplement with. If you can fill your cell membrane with more omega 3s, the cell membrane becomes more flexible, the receptors work better. All of the different biological structures in the in the membrane work better to include the electron transport chain. And then more importantly, Inflammation comes from the fatty acids in your cell membrane. So if you're filled with a bunch of omega-6s from corn, um, canola oil, all that kind of stuff, basically the American highly processed diet, not only is your membrane stiffer and just biologically won't function as well, like the ion channels and the receptors don't work as well, but when your body wants to turn on inflammation, it will take the omega-6 fatty acids and that becomes goes down the arachidonic acid and damaging inflammatory pathway. If you've got more omega-3s, you go down what's called a pro-resolvin pathway or a pro-healing inflammatory pathway. So if you have enough omega-3 in your body, if you need inflammation, let's say you got infected, you got a virus, you got cut, whatever, your body will have the appropriate amount of inflammation to treat that issue and then will shut it down. If you don't, if you're filled with omega-6 and a terrible American highly processed diet, that inflammation never shuts down and then it starts to attack. You get friendly fire, it's autoimmune. So you are what you eat and it's so, so true, particularly when it comes to the omega-3s. And there's a lot of studies out there. They're not, they're doing more and more in better ways with better techniques. But in general, the populations that are higher in omega-3 have fewer arthritic problems. Okay, so this is one way you can really help yourself. Reduction in arachidonic acid binding in the cell membranes, we talked about that, which means you reduce inflammation, fewer cytokines that damage you. Those are the little proteins that attack. And then uh, remember, omega-6 does become arachidonic acid and does attack you. So there have been studies done in rheumatoid arthritis that have proven that if you add omega-3s to the regular medications, they actually do better. Why? Because you remember the slide with all the red and the rheumatoid person, you push them more to the yellow side because they don't have the fatty acids that become red. They have all the fatty acids that become yellow and blue. So omega-3 is something you can do for yourself immediately. And this is one of the reasons I love the Mediterranean diet. Next slide. Okay, activity we talked about. So sedentary American lifestyle is basically horrible. We're killing ourselves. Sitting is the new smoking. I try to get everybody that I see to get at least a sit to stand desk and try not to sit for eight to 12 hours a day. It's just horrifically bad what we are doing to ourselves systemically. Regular movement is not only mandatory for preventing dementia and preventing heart disease, but it is better cartilage health and less arthritic pain. The biomechanics of your cartilage, how it works, how it handles pressure, how it handles shear, gets better when you move and you train it. Okay. Sitting all day increases arthritis more than activity well, particularly if you're doing the zone one, zone two, 30 minutes. I'm not talking about CrossFit and crazy things like that, of course. And then intermittent activity, pumping the cartilage, pumping the joint, changes the hydraulics inside the joint will actually feed the cartilage better. Because remember, it doesn't have its own blood flow. Per the World Health Organization, 66 to 80% of the human population, the global population, does not do enough activity right now to maintain a healthy longevity, good health span lifestyle. But even 30 minutes a day or about 8,000 steps, remember the 10,000 step moniker, that's probably 40 minutes of activity. Even just 30 minutes per day, zone one or zone two cardio will get you there. And even fidgeting like we talked about. So the number one way you can help yourself is to get out of the chair and move a little bit. Sleeping well will help you. Increasing your omega threes will help you. Staying away from sugar will help you far more than a lot of the drugs on the market, okay, when they put these things head to head. 
33%, one out of three of people with arthritis are totally inactive. And so what are they doing? They're just going to get worse and worse and worse. Even the CDC shows this. Pain is more severe for arthritis with, for adults with arthritis who are inactive than the ones who are not inactive. So net-net, same level of arthritis, same x-ray, same person. The one that sits most of the day hurts more than the one that's moving. This is why activity is so, so, so important. So look at, look at what we do. We sit at work seven and a half, eight hours. We sleep for eight, well, we should sleep for eight hours. We eat for an hour. We are on our computer for an hour and a half. We watch TV for an hour and a half. So you may stand occasionally for up to three hours a day and you may play golf, but nobody's doing what they're supposed to be doing to, pre to prevent pain and activity. And I'll tell you where it's the most common, the inactivity and in arthritic pain and the problems is where I live in Louisiana because it's it's so hot it's hard to do anything so you've got to work out ways either very early in the morning or very late in the evening to get out and move but movement is probably your best friend in the Mediterranean diet so we already talked about omega-3s the other keys to the Mediterranean diet which is what I like and I think is the most approachable and uh, the healthiest for the whole person because it includes social interaction and moderate exercise, and generally having a good mindset. The Mediterranean diet has been shown over and over and over again since like the 50s or 60s to reduce inflammation, to increase your levels of phytochemicals. Those are the molecules in fruits and vegetables that reduce inflammation and reduce oxidative stress. And your NF nuclear factor kappa beta pathway is diminished. Remember, that's a pathway that turns on inflammation at the genetic level. That gets turned on by oxidative stress, chronic inflammation, and badness. It gets turned off by goodness, like the Mediterranean diet. Olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, a hugely important part of this diet. Olive oil in and of itself has been shown to help with things like arthritis and heart disease. So when you take olive oil, a predominantly olive oil-based diet, and then you add in omega-3s, I mean, you're, this is like the dream world. This is like the greatest thing since sliced bread, no pun intended, because you only want to eat whole grain breads, which are really hard to make because I've tried. Um, and that comes down to the carbohydrate to the dietary fiber ratio, by the way. You want that 10 or less, I think. Um, a lifestyle of socializing and exercise. So the Mediterranean diet is really sort of a lifestyle. These are people that have uh, social groups. They go for walks with each other. They cook together. They don't go to restaurants and eat food that's been fried in oil that's been used about 10 times before it gets to your dinner plate. I mean, think about how horrifying that is. Oxidized oil, old oil cooking your food, and then you eat that. I mean, you might as well just drink poison almost. Um, and then most people that start the Mediterranean diet and adhere to it get an unintended weight loss. You don't even try to lose weight. You just do because everything works better and everything's healthier. The typical American diet, you're two times more likely to become frail and arthritic than people on a Mediterranean diet. Think about that. What drug can say that? That if you do this, it's two times better than anything else. And this is totally in your control. You just have to eat whole grain foods, good vegetables, fruits, and cook them yourself, ideally with olive oil. And then I supplement with omega-3 because I don't particularly like herring, although one of my be best friends likes herring. I find it repulsive. Um, I kind of like salmon, but I'm terrible at cooking it. So I supplement with omega-3, but I will eat a ton of olive oil, believe me. Um, how, oh, I, I personally take about six grams of omega-3 a day now. Um, the drugs where the drug companies went in and caught, you know somehow got a patent on omega-3, uh, those were capped at four grams a day, mostly because adherence was hard to get people to take more than that. Um, to date, no um, issues have been found at four grams or even more than that. Um, I think some studies up to 25 grams of omega-3 a day, there were still no complications like bleeding or whatever. But obviously you have to ask your treating physician, how much omega-3 can I take? I take six to eight grams a day because I, I didn't know any of this stuff until the past few years. So I'm fighting a lifetime of omega-6. So I'm trying to switch all my cells to be better functioning. But anyway, go back, I wanna talk about that study. This one study, they followed 4,000 patients, and the ones that were on a Mediterranean-type diet were less likely to develop osteoarthritis in any joint. So this is, I mean, this is so powerful. This is better than any drug out there. You eat the Mediterranean diet, you sleep so your body can repair itself, you reduce your stress by socializing and going on exercise, you exercise, and then maybe you supplement a little bit, but then guess what? you probably won't get arthritis, or if you do, you probably won't have that much pain.
Oh, somebody said I, that this was the first time they've heard a good explanation of why omega-3 and omega-6 works well. Thank you, because believe me, I took a lot of reading and research to figure it out because unless you look for this information, it is not getting told to you. Certainly not in med medical school, I can tell you that. Definitely not in my orthopedic residency. Okay, we have a question from Janet. Janet, you mentioned that Janet wants to know what I'm talking about when I say natural anti-inflammatories. Well, the most natural is exercise. The second one is nutrition, the Mediterranean diet. But I'm talking about things like turmeric, tart cherry extract, um, ginger, palmitoyl ethanolamide, cannabidiols, okay, CBD. All of these substances reduce activity of that NF-kappa beta pathway and diminish the production of relatively damaging cytokines like IL-1, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, all of that gets tamped down with the appropriate what we call flavonoids or phenolic compounds. So this is why you want to eat a colorful plate. You want orange vegetables and fruits. You want purple. You want red. You want blue. The colors are the plant's defense system, the flavonoids. And when we eat those, they also become our defense system. And so most of the colorful berries, like tart cherry, those are going to be your best sources of things like anthocyanins and um, different terpenes and whatnot that reduce inflammation. That's what I'm talking about natural. The synthetic ones, like ibuprofen or the COX-2 inhibitors, they block a single enzyme that stops that omega-6 arachidonic acid cascade. That's why when you take an ibuprofen, you generally feel relief immediately because um, it's blocking an enzyme. So when you block that enzyme, there's no conversion, so you don't have the prostaglandins. The natural things work differently. You're never going to get that single enzyme block of like, oh, I feel great just from taking one turmeric. Um, it takes time to get the system tuned up right where it's mo you're basically just changing the balance. You're reducing overall activity of the NF-kappa beta. You're reducing production of the inflammatory arachidonic acid cascade, and you're increasing production of the pro-resolve and pro-healing cascade. Now, at this point, for me, like if I have a muscle pain or something, if I just put a topical natural pain cream, it goes away because my system's primed now for all of this. And I can take a tart cherry and like, let's say, get rid of neck pain from operating for eight hours. But I wasn't like that before. I had to like get, get all of the badness out of my system and, and get all the goodness in with a better diet, supplementing with omega-3 and now I take I take every supplement that I have I take just so you know and here's some more alpha lipoic acid another great natural antioxidant this one's good because it can go through lipid membranes so a lot of oxidative stress happens in the lipid membrane it's called lipid peroxidation alpha lipoic acid can get into that fatty membrane and reduce it and it also can get into the water filled cytosol around the membrane and reduce um, oxidative stress on both sides. So this is great, especially for things like nerve-based pain because the nerves are surrounded by myelin, which is essentially sort of a fat kind of structure. And then tart cherry is just awesome for a number of reasons. I don't know what just happened. Okay, what, what just happened? Oh, what about what? Okay, moving on, sorry. So when should you see a doctor? Okay, let's talk about that. If your knee pain isn't getting wet, like let's say you did rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation for a few days, it didn't get better, you rubbed your topical, you're eating right, blah, blah, blah. When should you see a doctor? So let's talk about it now. Go on. Okay. So my next slide is, of course, be careful when you see a doctor. And here's, I'm going to tell you why. Do you know that the number one factor that will predict if you get an indication for surgery is actually where you live, your zip code, not what's wrong with you, not any other patient factor, um, not your comorbidities, like if you have diabetes or something else, but it is where you live. And this has been shown in multiple studies. This one is, is from 2004 out of Health Affairs. In this one, they compare the rates of surgery for hip fractures. Okay, so remember I told you sometimes a bone is broken and we know it needs to be fixed and needs to be fixed a certain way pretty standard. Everyone nationally and globally has the same thoughts about it. That's how hip fractures are. If somebody falls and breaks their hip, you fix it. 
and there's different ways to fix it, but we all kind of do it the same way. So what they looked at was rates of surgery for hip fractures in this region versus rates of surgery for total hip arthroplasty, hip replacement, total knee arthroplasty, knee replacement, and spinal fusion. And what they found was across these regions, there was little to no variation in the rates of surgery for hip fracture. So everybody kind of thinks the same there. But the variations for total hip and total knee were four to five fold. So like 500% different based on the zip code, okay? And then spine surgery was seven times different for the same problem and the same symptoms. So this tells you a couple things. Get a second opinion. Ideally get a second opinion in a different geographic region than where you are. And then just remember this because a lot of what we do in medicine is it really comes down to groupthink. So where you train, who you're around, what the culture is in your community. And then if you don't bother teaching yourself new things or getting new, new ideas, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Next slide. So Dartmouth has done great work in this. They've looked, they use Medicare data and uh, look around the country and a variety of different things, rates of disease of diabetes, rates of obesity, rates of uh, epidural steroid injections, rates of total knee surgery, et cetera. And then in this one particular region, they, they were looking at Florida. So in Fort Myers, Florida, there were consistently higher rates of total knees and total hips and back surgery than for Miami, which is just down the road. Okay, just separated by a little bit of a highway in Florida. Same people, okay, so they matched the groups. Same type of patient, same diagnosis, same problem, same levels of pain, et cetera, et cetera. If you lived in Fort Myers, you're getting a total hip replacement. If you live in Miami, you're probably not. And then the ri risk of having a total hip arthroplasty was greater than the national average. So really, if you lived anywhere else in the country, you would probably have a lower risk of getting a total hip than if you lived in Fort Myers. And then the risk of total knee was lower than the average of, of around. So, it, so actually, more people in the country will get total knees for a given pathology, fewer in Fort Myers, but you would get far more total knees in Fort Myers than you would in Miami. And then the risk of back, back surgery was way above the national average. Where I live in Louisiana, the risk of getting epidural steroid injections, narcotic prescriptions, and back surgery is sky high relative to the rest of the world. Um, so just when you go see a doctor, just keep this in mind, okay? It may be where you live makes a bigger difference than what's actually going on with your knee. So next slide. And then so now we're talking about appropriate use and indications and whatnot. And then now there's a ton of studies being done on this. So in this particular study, they used an algorithm like a computer AI algorithm to judge the quote unquote appropriateness of having a total knee arthroplasty in the United States. And they looked at 784 patients and they found that the indications for surgery were considered necessary by this validated algorithm only half the time. In appropriate and only 21%, okay, fully appropriate, and then inappropriate in at least five and sort of uncertain in 21. So this tells you that our indications are, mm, maybe there's no consensus here, and there really isn't. There's consensus for hip fractures, consensus for femur fractures, but like if you came to see me, I'm gonna err more towards natural, non-surgical sort of methodologies, and I'm gonna go through that whole differential, and I'm gonna figure out exactly why do you really hurt, and what we, can we do that's the safest and the most natural and empowers you to take care of yourself. You go somewhere else, you might get that metal and plastic sandwich, I don't know. But this is the stuff you need to think about. Next slide. So here's a good study that was in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015. So was that seven years ago? So they did a randomized controlled trial and they took two groups of people. There were 100 patients that were eligible for a total knee, okay? So they met some criteria, I guess, less than 50% joint on an x-ray pain, whatever the criteria was. One group was randomized to get the total knee replacement and then to have 12 weeks after that of non-operative rehab care. The other group did not get the total knee, but they did get that 12 weeks of non-op rehab care. So they both groups got the same post-operative rehab. One group got the knee, one group didn't. There were more problems or complications in the group that got the total knee. Their knee scores were slightly better than the other group. So they did have better knee scores once they got the metal and plastic sandwich than the other group, but they also had more adverse events and more complications. The group that didn't get the total knee, most of them never got a total knee. So in other words, they were cured enough that they didn't need to have that surgery just with the 12 weeks of the non-operative post-op care. So think about that. So 
when people say you failed conservative manager, or you haven't, or you failed all the non-op care, and now you, the only thing left for you is a total knee. I would kind of question that in the back of my mind because as we've talked about, the level and the quality of that non-operative care can be all over the map. And just remember this study, and this is a very prestigious medical journal. Um, most people that got randomized to the group that didn't get the total knee never went on to get a total knee. So that tells me something. Let's go on. Okay. So in summary for knee pain, knee pain can be from anything. Talked about that. Blood vessel clotted off, nerve pain, muscle weakness, muscle tightness, muscle attachment problems, connective tissue disorder, tendon contracture, ligament contracture, sprain, strain, cartilage damage, no cartilage damage, osteoarthritis, inflammation, 100 million things could cause knee pain. Okay, it's not always just that you're bone on bone. And there are many ways to manage those types of knee pains without surgery. We talked about all of that. The most important is diet, sleep, and exercise. Okay, uh, if you don't sleep, you will never repair your body and you will fall apart. I think you probably know that. Exercise, low level, zone one, two, 30 to 40 minutes a day, five days a week, ideally. Plus, you need to stay strong. Diet, my preference is a Mediterranean diet. A lot of physicians argue about this stuff, but for the reasons I told you, the phytochemicals, the socializing, the lifestyle, the heavy levels of um, vegetables and fruits and dietary fiber, and then the omega-3s and olive oil, I think Mediterranean diet is by far the best. That's what I try to follow. And then supplements for natural pain, which we talked about. So that's sort of what we talked about today, but the points to remember, up to 20% of total knee patients, even if they survive and their implant never gets replaced, are not happy. Um, and geography determines your rate of surgery more than your pathology and more than your patient preference. So it really comes down to group think of the surgeons, honestly. And then many asymptomatic people have meniscal tears, ligament tears, cartilage damage, arthritis, found on imaging, but they don't have any pain. So that tells me that there's other things involved than just what's seen on the imaging study. And all of that should be explored. So I know this was complicated and a lot of information probably confused you more than it helped you. But I think that if patients knew all of this, uh, probably a lot of unnecessary surgery would not happen, in my opinion. Next. I think we're done. All right. Okay, this is a foot question. Uh, somebody that had a type of bunion surgery on one foot and they think they're lined up for one on the other one and they've been wearing orthotics for six years. The question is, should they wear stability shoes? That again is a topic that's uh, fraught with um, controversy. So stability shoes, that whole thing came about in the, I want to say it was the seventies when Nike hired some podiatrists to come up with this concept. Um, my opinion, if your foot is strong and you don't have gross deformity and, um, you know, your arches don't completely fail you with every step, you probably don't need a stability shoe. And my other opinion is if you're using inserts, that should be enough power to control the foot where you don't need the shoe. On the other hand, with midfoot arthritis, a little rocker bottom does help a lot. Sometimes the stability shoes are just too much. They're too heavy and too thick, and they push you one way or the other. So that's tough to answer without actually examining you. But um, I think an insert with a stability shoe, that is, that is a lot of support. That pretty much guarantees that your foot muscles will never be used. So maybe explore that with your treating physician. And ask them if you could try just the inserts with a minimalist shoe or like a zero drop shoe or something like that and or a rocker bottom but anyway next well yeah so i problem is i it's hard for me to i i cannot treat somebody this way i'm just giving information um without examining someone looking at the x-ray yada yada it's gonna be hard for me to make solid recommendations it is confusing a lot of doctors are confused about this my partner and i sometimes don't agree um, whether you should always wear inserts, not wear inserts, stability versus neutral, minimal. I'm a fan of zero drop and minimal use of inserts because I want people's feet to be strong. But believe me, I'm in the minority there. So most of the podiatry world and the orthopedic surgery world, they love the big stability shoes and they love inserts. 
So I would go talk to your treating physician and then maybe seek a second opinion where you live. Okay, so next slide. So I'm just gonna tell you sort of maybe some combinations of supplements you can do in addition to your good Mediterranean diet with your extra virgin olive oil and in addition to sleeping a solid seven to eight hours a night, massively important, and your exercise that we talk about. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Well Theory is my line of natural medicine products that I really got into because I was tired of seeing people on Percocet, fentanyl, opioids, Opana, all these terrible drugs. I got tired of seeing terrible outcomes from surgery in my community. Nobody was happy. Patients were miserable. And, and then I started to notice they're all stiff. A lot of people are overweight. They have a bunch of other medical problems. And that's when I started learning about non-communicable chronic disease, chronic inflammation, oxidative stress. And I knew there's a better way. And so I started coming up with and there's a million supplement companies out there, but my theory is really fundamentally around reducing chronic inflammation and reducing oxidative stress. And then through that, helping the AMPK pathway and then ultimately the sirtuins and the mTORs, which we're going to talk about in the next talk on longevity. So that's the well theory. So it's all natural medicines and supplements. I can't say medicines. We're not allowed to say medicine. Natural supplements to support your health. Palmitoyl ethanolamide is an amazing one. It's one of my first molecules that I fell in love with and continue to recommend often. This is a fatty acid amide that you actually produce in your body every day. It's ubiquitous throughout the body. Anytime you have a site of damage or inflammation or an inflamed nerve or nerve pain, your body's going to produce extra PEA to reduce that uh, inflammation and calm everything down. Problem is like with everything else, this is one of the endocannabinoids or it's in that family like CBD is. Most of us are deficient in that system. So some people, particularly those with neuro neuropathic pain or nerve-based pain for any variety of reasons, I'll uh, recommend PEA to supplement it. Uh, there are very few, if any, side effects, maybe nausea at very high doses, as opposed to anti-inflammatories. If you took a single dose of naproxen or ibuprofen, will destroy your gut biome. Um, and then I'm not even talking about the kidney problems and bleeding ulcers and things like that. So PEA is way safer and equally as effective, and it's actually used as a first-year treatment in Europe. So I love PEA. And then the Essential Multi, this is one of my first products that I came on because it's everything I told everybody that had surgery to take to make sure they healed well and had a good immune system so that they could heal their wound and heal their bone and feel better. And then I add PEA to this one to reduce pain. So it's got high dose vitamin C, hugely important for the immune system and for collagen cross-linking, cartilage, tendons, ligaments. Okay. Vitamin C is a cofactor there. D3, D3 receptors are found throughout the body on bone, on connective tissue, hugely important. And the magnesium, which is one of the primary cofactors for all, about hundreds of chemical processes that go on in your cells. So vitamin C, vitamin D, magnesium, calcium, also hugely important. And then this one has PEA, which helps reduce pain symptoms. And then these are the Delta-8 gummies. So this is a variant of CBD. It's actually a variant of THC. So it's Delta-8, not Delta-9. But it is a cannabidiol out of the cannabis sativa plant. Delta-8 is OTC over the counter right now. It is not controlled. Hugely powerful for reducing inflammation and pain. So my favorite is the topical Delta-8. I've told you I love topicals because they don't get systemic. Um, but I make plenty of medical marijuana recommendations for people with chronic pain who don't want to be on narcotics. Um, and Delta-8 is sort of in that family. So this is just another way to do that. Um, it's, it's sort of, I don't want to say a lower gear, but <clears throat> it's just not quite as powerful as the Delta-9 THC that's being pushed out of dispensaries right now. So another good way to reduce inflammation and upregulate your endocannabinoid system. Tart cherry we talked about, the joint health multi we talked about that has turmeric, ginger, and PEA. Turmeric and ginger and PEA have all been studied for these painful arthritic conditions and are all successful. So this is just a combination of those. Alpha lipoic acid we talked about, also a first tier treatment in other countries for neuropathic type pains, pain in general, and it's also great for brain health. That's why I take it. And then the our nervous system multi is the one that has omega-3 and resveratrol. Resveratrol is your longevity molecule or so-called longevity molecule. There's, 
you know, of course, with all science, there's controversy there. But resveratrol is what's in grape skins, dark grapes, and also the Japanese knotweed and in some other plants, hugely anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. And, and it upregulates the sirtuins. Sirt1, I think, is one it really upregulates, which help with DNA repair. So it's good for longevity. And then this has omega-3s with a, a good ratio of EPA to DHA. So all of those are geared towards reducing chronic inflammation, reducing oxidative stress, and promoting all of your innate abilities to repair DNA and extend longevity and wellness and reduce chronic non-communicable non -communicable chronic diseases, such as arthritis. So hopefully that helps you. We have a couple questions. Is there ever free shipping? And speaking of inflation, it stopped me from ordering because it's ordering all the cabinet. Okay. The question was, will we ever have free shipping and inflation is killing this particular customer and they've been able, they've had to stop ordering. Unfortunately, inflation is killing all of us. The money supply, more money was added in the past two years than in our entire history as a country. The supply of money increased by 40%. So everything costs more. And also fuel costs more on top of that. So all shipping has gone up. It is crushing us. Um, and, you know, getting supplies in, making the thing, getting it shipped out. Um, so we per, we're a family owned company. It's just me, really. Family owned company with my team. Um, so we already have it as lean as we can, but we are running an Independence Day sale right now. So now is probably the time. Anytime there's a sale, it's a good time to stock up um, to reduce shipping costs. Because net net, if you get like six bottles of something, it's probably going to cost the same to ship as one bottle generally. I mean, don't quote me on that because I'm, you know, just thinking about when I order things. The question is, do you need to take alpha lipoic with food? Uh, I don't. But if you, some people with supplements tend to get heartburn or like they just get nauseated. Um, I don't. So I can take, I take a handful of everything every morning and then more at night and i just take it with water generally but i will take my longevity like when i take the um, nmn the resveratrol and berberine those kind of things i'll take those with like a fatty yogurt so they absorb better turmeric you should take with a fat so like yogurt or whole milk or something it absorbs better alpha lipoic i think you can go either way just whatever you like to do Creatine, CRP. So the question is, <clears throat> Carol had a question. She has run-of-the-mill arthritis um, and asked if when you're injured, do your CRP, which ones else did you want to know? C-reactive protein in your platelets and sed rate, do they increase? So your sed rate and CRP increase after surgery. So I'm sure they there's a mild, like maybe short-term elevation after a severe injury. I'm not talking about a paper cut or an ankle sprain. Generally, if you have high CRP or particularly a high sensitivity CRP, that is not a good sign. And that is a harbinger of bad health to come. And you should probably really actively manage your inflammation. And yes, these supplements will help with that. So over time, by pulling out damaging cytokines and then lining your cell membrane with omega-3, so you're producing the good cytokines, you can control your inflammatory milieu, I guess, or sort of the paradigm you live in. It takes time, uh, but it can be done. So yes, but, but remember, short-term inflammation is good. If you injure yourself, if you cut your leg, you want your platelets to go down there and you want that blood clot to form and you want inflammatory mediators to go there and clear out the debris and start the healing process. What you don't want is for that process to never end. That's chronic inflammation. Injury related short term inflammation is actually a good thing. That's why we that's why we even have that whole system in our body. You catch a virus, you want to feel sick. You want that inflammation. You want that fever because it, that means you're fighting it off. But you just don't want all that to linger. But the, what I do is I take all these natural things because it helps balance the system. So you get the appropriate short-term inflammation when your body is stressed, but it doesn't linger and start to attack yourself. All right. Well, thank you for joining me. That was fun. Who knew there was so much to talk about with knee pain? Um, but there is. Hopefully you guys all have a great weekend, a happy fourth. And um, thank you so much for joining us.